Hello friends, who's ready for some Overwatch? Berkeley Stevens here alongside Chase Newcomb. As always, we'll be guiding you through the first match of the night for the stream, and we're headed all the way up in the Legends East Division for Rensselaer Polytechnic versus Converse University. So sit back, relax, get ready for an action-packed first to three series of incredibly high-ranked Overwatch 2. Chase, to start things off, what do you think will be the key to victory tonight for these teams? Is it going to be a matter of raw talent, or do you think compositions and strategy are going to play a bigger factor? Berkeley, great question. I think if you are at the Legends division, you've got the raw talent already. It's in your bones, in your blood. It's going to come down to strategy, communication, and which team is more adaptive, in my opinion, depending on... Uh, we'll determine who is going to win this series. Now, as we know... You can go into these matches with a plan, Berkeley, but what is going to be definitive for these teams is what happens when it, things don't go according to plan. And Overwatch can be a very back-and-forth game where you are picking one comp, it's working for maybe a couple of rounds, and then it's countered. Now you have to find a new comp. So whatever team is quickest on their feet, I would say, is going to take this match tonight. Yeah, Chase, without a doubt, Overwatch is not one of those games where you can put all your eggs into one basket, at least not since like the GOATS meta where there's just one viable thing and your plan B really doesn't matter because it doesn't come out. Plan B has come out all the time on this current patch, so let's go ahead and take a look at the RPI roster to see who's going to be starting for their plan A tonight. Chase, why don't you rattle this one off? Oh, I'm thrilled to be talking about the RPI roster. We have Tevatron, Bot Boy, Web Slinger, Z Hobo, and Shupak. Now, Berkeley, tell me, run me through what we have over on the side of Converse University. Well, Converse, they come into this one with a 1-1 one one record. They 3-0 Delaware Academy and lost 0-3 to, to Redbirds. They suffered the same fate as everyone against them, so no hard feelings there. Kicking their roster off is going to be Hammer, Still Kiwi, Orion, Garchomp, and Quicks. Now, RPI, they also played Redbirds, and they lost 0-3. So, Chase, we really don't know how these two teams are going to stack up. In the fall, Converse had a much better season, but RPI has had months to adjust, so we'll see if they can bring their A game and stick it to one of the better teams from the fall in just their second game of the season this spring. You bring up months to adjust, Berkeley, but RPI has also had a couple weeks to adjust as they had a bye last week. Converse is going into this match 1-1, where RPI is going into this match 0-1, and hopefully they learned something from their Redbirds match in the first week of the season. Hopefully they did. I mean, Redbirds is always just the teacher that everyone hates to take the class from, but you can learn so much from Redbird Esports, as everyone who follows the collegiate scene knows. Uh, things have changed here in the spring semester. We're no longer doing set map pools. We're on a pick ban system. Oasis was the first control map that was banned, and we're headed to Nepal first. Chase, what do you think we're going to see? Oh, in Nepal, we are likely to see some Symmetra at this high of a level, Berkeley. But, you know, we made some predictions last week over in the Champions and Challengers divisions, and we were just completely off course. Honestly, it's going to be a determinant on what composition these teams are strong with and that may be a different composition than what they decide to pull out in payload this is a completely different map style on control and they be maybe looking to lock down a point rather than push a payload looking at both teams it looks like i was inevitably wrong berkeley we do see some cole cassidy on the map we got some may and orion actually gonna pull out the briquette for this first point yeah, Brigitte, one of the uh, heroes that benefited a ton from the last patch, but no surprise there, Orion does switch over to the Baptiste just to mess with you a little bit there, Chase. Uh, but one thing is for sure, we're going to see a lot of Cassie tonight. Garchomp on the side of Converse, Web Slinger on the side of RPI. The doors are open, we are underway here for Nepal point number one. It's an expectation to see Cole Cassidy at this high of a level, especially since his changes, Berkeley, I think. That hero adds a ton of value to whoever's playing it as long as they're able to dink those headshots. And one thing that is different between these compositions and Converse, they're running Hammer on the May, so they're going to have these walls. Hammer already having to retreat, though, in a ton of trouble as RPI looked like they were going to be heavily threatening to close in right there, but luckily Hammer was able to get away, stay out of the action for a moment, and now this is where the action really starts. Contesting this opening point here on Sanctum, not an easy task. We almost never see it contested until a team is wiped, but we're going right into it now. Tevatron pays with his life, trying to go straight to the objective, and just swung through by Quicks. Converse taking the objective first. Yeah, notice Quicks and Tevatron's 
duel on the far end of point near the area where you're able to go underneath the point. Very smart play from Shupak, trying to get some positioning and look for a boop. Unfortunately, unable to find it. Converse will take that first point and put themselves in a pretty good position, Berkeley is. They're also winning this alt economy battle. Orion already has uh, Baptiste Field online, so I'm eager to see if that will determine the flow, really, of this first point. Yeah, I'm wondering here. Both Ant Matrixes come out. Tevatron has the Fire Strike to combo with his, and the Fire Strike scorches Hammer. But Quicks lays down a slam. Euphoria in the front line as Quicks swings for the fences and comes up with a quad. My, my. What great positioning from Quicks. That's a great Reinhardt player. Berkeley, you and I, being former Reinhardt mains, we know positioning is everything with this hero. And being able to stop your charges now in Overwatch 2 adds so much value for being able to get in get those kills like we just saw from Quicks. We'll see if he remains aggressive. Looks like he's right in the front door here for this next upcoming fight. Oh my. Sneaky oh guard chop here. The Deadeye finds the pair, fanning the hammer, trying for more. And the front line for Converse stands so strong so far, Chase. That was a cheeky play from guard chop, hiding in the corner, waiting for the Deadeye to pop it as soon as everyone ran through. With that being said though, Berkeley, Converse has done a fantastic job of offsetting and using as minimal alts as possible to keep their econ up. That's gonna be RPI now using everything to get into point, but that's gonna be Hammer in the back line throwing down the blizzard, stopping the rip tire and freezing Orion in place. Nice little slam there from Tevatron. Is it going to be enough? They're not able to find any eliminations off of it. RPI still having to backpedal. Quicks, another wow. fire strike that scorches Z Hobo, and it is a 100 to 0 sweep to start things here for Converse. What a series we're going to have on our hands as well, Berkeley. The, that was a masterclass in positioning. I mentioned a bit at the beginning of the series how pivotal positioning will be in determining the success of these teams and Converse doing a great job of finding flanks where necessary as well as utilizing the abilities that they have at their disposal to shut down RPI completely. They didn't even let them get to point in both of those defenses that they held. Converse looking to be a very strong team going into the set. Yeah, utilizing their resources like you were just saying, that was what they did to a perfect T. If you're trying to scout Converse, well, in the first fight, they used a Shatter and an Ant Matrix. Second fight, they flanked with a Deadeye. Third fight, they flanked with a Maywall and a Blizzard. This team always knows what trick to have up their sleeve, and they know how to play that hand perfectly. Thus far, from what we've seen, Berkeley, but anything can change in these series, and like I said, Maybe RPI is considering what adaptive changes they need to make for a transformational experience of winning this game. That's going to be Converse Maywalled off of point. RPI looking for a couple of kills. That's going to be Quicks in the corner swinging as much as possible. The Immortality Field utilized by RPI. Tevatron will find two kills. It's going to be a regroup for Converse. And RPI changed one thing about their composition. They slapped on a May. Bot Boy now playing May. And immediately it worked for them. They mirror Converse's composition. And now they've gotten the point for the first time in the match. May gets a lot of hate in Overwatch. Maybe more so in Overwatch 1 than 2. But Berkeley, I think that May is one of the best, if not the best, DPS hero in Overwatch 2. For the sole fact that you have a pseudo tank in a meta where you only have one tank. These walls, as we've seen so far in this series, have provided so much value for these teams. Yeah, she's like a necessary evil. Oh, Hammer trying to throw out the Blizzard actually went down before that was able to land. No Blizzard for Converse, and now they already have to start backpedaling. This fight is a wash, and they know it. Yeah, unfortunately, Shupak going for the boop, but gonna find the kill off of the secondary fire almost immediately. RPI sitting comfortable on point now with 50%, and they have the sound barrier. They have the Earth Shatter to use at their disposal. Converse is gonna have to dry hot fight for a minute. Sure, they have the amplification matrix, but I'm not sure that will be enough for them. Yeah, losing that Blizzard last fight was crucial. Now they're going to have to go into one with really nothing to defend themselves with. And once again, it's going to be a quick fight. Just wipe your hands clean of it. Converse has to come right into the next fight. Quicks needs to charge up this Shatter. Garchomp needs another big Deadeye. Somehow they have to get this objective back in their hands. 
I not sure what the play is going to be called here, but they have about 10 seconds to figure it out. You're absolutely right, utilizing the Blizzard when they did. Very unfortunate. We're going to see the Deadeye popped up top from RPI's Web Slinger, looking to separate the rest of the roster. Tevatron going for a really nice charge kill. Not going to find it in the corner, oh. but instead going to find a massive Earth Shatter, taking out three and securing the second point for RPI. That is how you answer RPI. You put on Con versus Comp and you sweep round two. So far, we've had a sweep in round one and round two, Chase. This one, usually we call Barn Burners when it's 99-99 and it goes to overtime, but a sweep and then a sweep for the other team, that sets the, sets the stage for something great in round three. It also goes to show you, Berkeley, how volatile control can be once you have control of the point it is very at this level it is very difficult to give it up if you have the coordination and positioning that rpi and converse is showing us this evening yeah and just one little mistake like losing one ultimate like hammers blizzard that can cost you the whole round even if it happens 40 percent of the way through the round at Absolutely. legends division you just can't afford to make those kind of mistakes you have to think of it in the vein as well. When you're in these other game modes, you have minutes upon minutes to take payload and push it. We're going on 100% timers here. So that's about a minute and a half total that they just have to hold these points. Converse is able to avoid the May wall that time. Both Lucio's fall, they'll be getting back into the fight pretty quickly. Right now, RPI holds the point, but Converse, they want to squeak their way in from the low ground. Tevatron knocked awfully low, supported well by Z-Hobo, and a little bit of breathing room for now as RPI hold the objective for just a moment here before things get back underway. Yeah, they're trying to make their way into point, and I like these very small back and forth skirmishes, Berkeley. It's not working out to RPI's advantage because Converse had the positioning, but they were looking to get a pick, right? And if you'll notice very carefully on how these players are playing, they're uh, playing around the natural structures in these points uh, almost to a T. And that's because playing what we call in Collegiate Overwatch line of sight, if you're at this level, you should know what line of sight is, but playing around LOS line of sight, utilizing the natural cover to your ability and not relying solely on your tank will set you up for victory in these fights. Yeah, sometimes you can prop up a Maywall to give you a little bit of extra cover if you're not behind the shield, but coming into this fight, Converse leading the way, and it's Hammer doing the heavy lifting. Four kills in this fight as the Honda walks Converse in, and they take the objective. Yeah, you weren't quite able to see based on how we were moving around point there, but Hammer on Hanzo, arguably having as much of an effect as Web Slinger on this Cole Cassidy. Hanzo can have so much value if you hit just one headshot, fully charged arrow, that can get immediate kills. And when you're at this division, Berkeley, you're less likely to miss than what you would be at Navigators or Emergents. Shatter comes in, that one gets blocked by a quick Dragon Strike from the left side. They have an Ant Matrix on the right. Not a lot of safe room for RPI to stand, but they're making it work. We've got a three versus three right now. Tevatron is still alive. Well, Quicks is not. RPI has a tank in the fray. Converse has to get this done without a big hero to take that space back. And right now, Tevatron, this is when you get aggressive. You've got a Lucio on your side, and this is where you have to just take the fight to Converse, but still Kiwi doesn't make it easy. Drops the sound barrier to keep everyone on Converse alive, and reinforcements have arrived. Quicks is back. Garchomp is popping off. They have a shatter if they need it, but they don't. Wow. And that's also a big differential between this division and other divisions, Berkeley. Converse University was able to hold that point with just two to three members on their roster alive. Being able to play around the resources you have at your disposal, like you mentioned earlier, Berkeley, you can take out five-man rosters as they're pushing in. That's what Converse did to keep RPI off point. They used still Kiwi's sound barrier to keep them alive in time for Quicks to come back, get a couple of kills, and send RPI packing. No real mistakes so far in this round for either team. Round three has definitely been more exciting than one and two. Who's got to win it out here? RPI making a stay. Wow. Two picks early in this fight. It seems like they've got it, but this is just how the last fight started. Converse love to hang around for a long time, but here they're going to have to reset. It looked like as well the strategy of Orion and still Kiwi on Converse was to just stall off point, which is a beautiful strategy um, at this time in the game. They're at 92%. They were probably pushing for that 99. But realistically, if Converse retakes here, Berkeley, that could be this map in their favor. 
Yeah, they're threatening to do it. They have a Dragon Strike, they have the Ant Matrix again. RPI, they've got a very similar alt economy as well. Dragon Strike's gonna lead us off here on the back again? side of the objective. RPI, they're in some trouble. Webslinger couldn't get out of it. Hammer goes down though, it's a one for one trade. Garchop comes alive with that kill onto Z Hobo. They've gotta find more, they need it fast. Right now it's Converse. They're making the leg work. And it looks like Nuke, they're gonna have this point for just eight seconds. Does RPI have enough time to get back? I don't think so, Berkeley. They're gonna need a miracle and a half to get back in the next four seconds. If they do, it's gonna be a fight for a second. Wow! As I say that, we see the dash from Webslinger swapping over to Genji. That's gonna be Converse now defending point against RPI. If RPI takes this, Berkeley, that will be their map. Great stuff there by Webslinger to get right onto the point in the nick of time, but it doesn't look like it's going to be enough. Overtime burns down and Converse lead the game one to zero. That last point was an absolute slobber knocker back and forth, Berkeley. I was not expecting RPI to put up the fight they did, but that makes me extremely invigorated for this series. Quicks with the play of the game. I think this is going to be on point one, and it is. This is right at the start here. This was beautiful stuff in the front line, laying it down, everything done up in the front line. Garchomp rolls in for support. I mean, Converse in round one looked like a world beater, and then RPI answered so well in rounds two and three. I think we're going to have a very close series on our hand if Nepal tells us anything. I think so too, Berkeley. However, we could see a very different payload map. The way that Legends Division works is it can be an absolute showstopper or we can go back and forth. It seemed like at the beginning of this series, it was leaning more towards Converse for, you know, being and having the advantage. But as we went further throughout, RPI showed that they could hang. Yeah, and what I like about the pick band system, opposed to the set map pools that we've had for the previous five semesters of NECC, is that it? I feel like it gives the loser a much better chance of winning the next map. You can go in, pick the best map that suits your team's strengths, and I think we're going to have a lot more four or five map series than we're used to in the past previous semesters. I certainly hope so. That's the definition of competitive integrity. That's the, the reason why we're here and why we have the divisional model in the NECC. But once you hit the very top 1%, like we're in right now in the Legends division, even a fraction of a percent is going to make all of the difference in these games. Yeah, everyone in this lobby is a grandmaster, so by no means could I or any team I was ever on hang in this game, and I feel like I was on some decent ones, but Legends Division, I mean, that is just darn near top-tier esports. We know what Redbirds can do. They basically went out in contenders at, like, a professional level, and a lot of these teams are just a notch below that. I think Redbirds lost a couple of maps in the fall, so... A lot of these teams can can hang at the highest level of Overwatch. Absolutely. Now, going into the next map, Berkeley, we're going to have a hybrid map. Out of Blizzard World, Numbani, Kings Row, Midtown, and Pariso, where do you anticipate we'll be headed? I have no idea. We haven't really seen too much from these teams. We've just seen the Reinhardt made death ball composition. So if mm -hmm. Kings Row doesn't get banned, I kind of think that's where we end up. If it does, maybe Blizzard World, but... If Kings Row gets banned, I honestly have no clue. What are your thoughts? See, my thoughts are Converse is one game up. So at this point, they want to play the card that is working for them because they don't want to pull out any other strategies if they have to, right? That's sort of a back pocket resource that they have and maybe throwing out a monkey comp that they've been practicing. They don't want to do that until they're put on the back foot. So they picked something that played to their advantage, which was this May Reinhardt composition. So with that being said, Berkeley... I actually think inadvertently you hit the nail on the head. I think they go to King's Row or they go to Blizzard World and they force that. And we just got word from production that is what happened. So Converse banned Numbani. That would have been the dive comp map that they're avoiding. And we head to King's Row. So I would imagine Converse goes right back at it with the May Reinhardt Lucio Bap comp that we just saw. And it worked great for them. Uh, Nuke, that was a really good point you made. And you honestly just called your shot. Pointed to center field like Babe Ruth and you hit it out. Uh, you know, I don't miss Berkeley. If, if you've known anything <laughs> casting me for six, casting me, casting with me for six semesters, it's that Nuke doesn't miss. Nuke does not miss. Nuke knows college esports like nobody else. Uh, so heading into Kings Row, do you think RPI tried to shake up the death ball at all? Or do you think Kings Row is one of those maps where you really can't deviate from it on this patch? 
I think RPI needs to make slight changes. I don't think they need to make entire changes to their whole composition, but maybe put someone on Kiriko. See if that makes a huge difference. We're going to see, though, as we head straight into King's Row, we're going around side the Mandata statue in the Alderworth Hotel, getting a beautiful shot of the map. Speaking of which, shout out to our production team. We got Hippie and Bryce on the back end, bringing you the action from the camera and the PC's perspective. <laughs> How about daytime King's Row? I mean, it's just such it's a odd. nice little sight. We're used to the cool lighting here, but it just feels right to have this map right at sundown. Yeah, it, it seems, I don't know, it still doesn't seem right. I also would like more, I don't know, give me instead of day and night, give me early morning sunrise and twilight. That That's what I want. I feel like this is close to that sort of lighting. I mean, it's by no means like high noon, but look at that. The yeah. Observer just giving us a shot of the sun. I think it's around like 9.15 in the morning. PM? Okay, okay. I was going to say, what? <laughs> Maybe 9.15 in the morning is accurate here. Something that we're not seeing here, Berkeley, that you might see at other divisions is a Widowmaker. I'm surprised neither side opted for that early Widow pick. Yeah, I mean... A lot of the time in these higher ranked divisions, you can trust a player to go for that headshot pick early. Yeah, a little bit of a shocker that we don't see it here. Hammer on the side of Converse playing Junkrat. RPI sticking with the May Reinhardt composition, not deviating from it. And stepping up into the front line on the Alderworth corner, looking for a May wall here, but Converse really isn't overstepping. They're not giving Bot Boy any good looks at this wall. Yeah, Converse making the smart decision of picking May on this first round defense. This wall has so much value, you can block off so much. I'm actually surprised they were able to just block off Converse. Converse really did nothing about it. Converse realizing they're slipping on this point and they're gonna back up. That's exactly the difference between having a May and a Junkrat, right? Hammer had a lot of value on that Junkrat in the first point by getting percentage, but there was no kills effectively for Converse that swayed that fight in their favor. Botboy didn't need to get the kills to have the same value. Throwing up that May wall was enough to push Converse off point. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised to see Hammer on the Junkrat here, especially on King's Row where the choke points are way tighter than the ones we see on the ball. So you would imagine the May wall is more effective, more necessary, but we'll see what Hammer can do here with the Rift Tire. Luckily for Converse, they have that ultimate online early. Hammer comes alive with the first kill of this fight. RPI having to backpedal under the archway. Hammer gets another one on the shoot hawk there. And right now Converse gets a hold. Streets phase, I think, is where their composition might shine the most out of any of the three points. Now, Berkeley, I'm a little bit of an old man, so you might need to remind me which match it was, but we casted a match just in the past couple weeks, I believe it was week one, where there was a full hold directly underneath this overpass. And that's what you can determine at this high level of Overwatch, is getting through, whether or not you're able to get through this area. We're seeing a lot of coordination from RPI as they drop down underneath the overpass. They drop the blizzard. We're gonna see an earth shatter in retaliation we're seeing dead eyes back and forth, dropping ultimates left and right, but it's seeming Converse is coming out on top. Yeah, that was a hard one to follow, but when that Earth Shatter landed, I saw stars over four out of five players' heads on RPI up in the hunt. So you know that Quicks landed that thing, and they had the resources to pile on with it. Converse, they spent pretty much everything in their bank, but luckily Quicks was able to hit that Shatter and hit it big. Well, Converse spent quite a bit in their bank. RPI, however, still has the Earth Shatter, and that's what Tevatron's looking for. Finds not one person on the team, though, as that Maywall from Botboy will save the rest of the, or unfortunately block Tevatron's Earth Shatter. I was confused there for a second. Wow, that will send Converse backwards, though, as they realize, you know, maybe we need to regroup. Looks like there's going to be no archway hold here, and I think that game was Fresno State versus University of Oregon, another Legends Division game, that one in Legends right. West. Uh, but yeah, not gonna happen today. Headed toward the end of Streets Phase. Webslinger goes down to spam damage there. Converse should have an easy time cleaning up this fight. RPI has no alts to defend themselves, and they speed boost straight out of town. Just notice as we're watching as well how fast 
these teams are regrouping, setting up, and getting into position. There is no side talk. There is no, oh, well, what if I just wall ride and mess around? No, they are serious, they are to the point, and they are getting the job done. Amplification Matrix dropped from Orion, trying to find a pick onto Tevatron. That's going to be Quicks with a double Earth Strike kill. Fire Strike kill, that is going to hurt in the back line. Sending RPI back to the spawn room and giving Quicks that necessary earth shatter that oh, they're going to set up for. This is this is some sneaky stuff. This is what Converse does. If they have a chance to set up a fight where you can't see them, they are going for some cheeky flank play every single time. Get ready for Quicks to lay it down. Hopefully RPI are going to see that there's no Ryan in the front line. Oh, but they don't. Three gets stunned. Luckily, the immortality field is there, but it matters not. The Deadeye cleans house in the back line. That's what you get for being creative. We try and see all too much of players going for these scripted kills or trying to play around the front line. I love the strategy from RPI from being a sneaky snake, getting in the back line, slithering in and RKOing where necessary to find those weak spots in RPI's uh, regrouping. Converse doing a great job of staying on top here and holding the defense. Yeah, it's risk and reward, right? And so far, it's paid off huge for Converse. Starting this next fight, Ant Matrix opens it up here. That's going to get Converse to backpedal a full corner. So now RPI, it made some space with that ult. They don't survive the Riptire clean. Chupac goes down. And I believe it was as he was casting the sound barrier. So RPI, again, it's one of those fights where an ultimate is blundered just a fraction of a second too late. They want to swing it back, though. They still have a frontline presence. Tevatron has a shatter if he's able to send it, and he does. Two Scorchies get down. Orion and Hammer are felled, and here we still have RPI standing tall. Yeah, that was Garchomp able to take out Z Hobo, though. They're only going to have Shupak right now. Shupak making a play in the back line for Garchomp, and going to fall to a headshot. Oh my, you do not want to be on the other side of that Peacekeeper when those shots are taken, Berkeley. Yeah, Shupak going down right there is going to be crucial. RPI, I don't think they can get this done going up against a front line with a Bap and a Lucio. This Reinhardt can just run straight at you. RPI do choose the wiser, and they back off. Garchomp just clutched that for Converse. Absolutely, it staggered them just enough for them to regroup. Seeing the sound barrier pop, that's the immortality field, and that's a valuable resource. RPI have to dispose. Bopway, we just noticed, switched over to the Soldier 76, but they're finding pick after pick in the front line between Still Kiwi, Garchomp, and Quicks. Converse, looking like they're gonna hold before RPI is able to hit the second point with High Noon and Earth Shatter still in the bank. Man, Converse is cooking right now. I mean, that Garchomp clutch, that was what that whole round came down to, was that last pick there, just on the flank. Garchomp able to live for just long enough and find one on the way out. Clutched it for Converse. The entire defense was able to set back up in a strong spot on Streets phase, and RPI couldn't quite get back in time to get in clean to the fight that they wanted. It is so rare, Berkeley, that we see these clean of fights where there's a clear cut beginning, middle, and end. I, we, if we have seen a stagger so far in this game, it has been such a minuscule stagger. And that's what I love about these teams, right, Berkeley? They know when they need to get in and they know when they need to get out. A beautiful example of that was when they dropped the amplification matrix on the corner and they just backed up to the other corner, completely out of line of sight of that matrix. Yeah, I mean, teams and legends are just incredible at just backing up. They know how to respect space from ultimates, and they are fine with just hitting a speed boost, going around the next corner, and just giving up a little bit of space. As long as it doesn't give up the point, it doesn't right. matter. You can concede space all day long on a map as long as you're not giving up the actual objective that matters. Exactly, and while we're not seeing a Widowmaker, Hammer will be making the swap over to Hanzo, looking for a cheeky first pick. Not gonna find it, but Hanzo's still a great pick, whereas if you pick Widow here, you're more than likely switching off after you take this first point. Uh, I guess you could carry it throughout the map. Hanzo just overall, in my opinion, the better pick. 
Yeah, we'll see if Hammer can get to work. He was lacing bullseyes on Nepal for the one point that he played Hanzo. We're going to see if the RPI Maywall from Bot Boy is going to be a big issue for the Converse attack. If it splits him off, maybe Converse go back over to a May quickly. Hammer does go down up top, so already you're scratching your head a little bit on the Hanzo pick. And immediately RPI goes hyper aggressive, just throwing everything into the front line. Chupac goes down though. They're able to kill quick, so it looks like RPI should still have a handle on this fight, having removed the Converse tank. RPI hit the pedal to metal because they did get the pick early on Hammer, and that was all green lights for the team, no matter how separated they were, to get around that Mandata Fountain and do as much damage as possible. Shupak leading the charge last time. However, it's gonna bite them in the butt a little bit here, as we are gonna see the Maywall dropped from Bop Boy as well as the Amplification Matrix and Immortality Field for RPI to take this point. Great positioning overall from this team, getting in, calling these targets, and following up where necessary to be a cohesive unit in this defense. Yeah, and the Maywall didn't make a ton of difference in the first fight. It was the pick on Hammer that got it started. But in that second fight, they rotated into the Alderworth Hotel. They kept the fight tight. They put up a Maywall, and Quicks had no chance of living. Still, Converse hasn't put on a May of their own. Hammer swapped over to the Junkrat instead. Tevatron has the Shatter. Wants to lay it down. Looks like a kid in the candy store just eyeing up the Converse offense. Flanks around the statue. Stuns three. Can they get these kills? They find Orion. They're hungry for more. There's blood in the water. Quix goes down as well, and RPI continue to hold strong. I think that's the most awkward amplification matrix I've ever seen. Was that just set up on the Maywall? Is that why that was so high up? I, yeah, it must have been. Just a little bit off side there. Just Maywalled up the ant matrix. Well, what was silly to me was Tevatron jumped to get that fire strike through the wall, and it ended up getting a kill. But it's just still an awkward push nonetheless. We're going to see the Blizzard now pop as well from Bob Boy, and that's going to shut down and freeze any push coming through from Converse. However, Converse is going to look to regroup fast quickly because they got three ultimates online. They'll need to make use of them quick. Yeah, they still want it. Quick lays it down in the back line. That stuns three, but he's pinned all the way up front. Quicks actually goes down to Tevatron, who with a charge makes all the space in the world. Converse once again, they have to back off. They wanted to take that fight incredibly fast, and it bit them. Now they just have 60 seconds left to get this first point. Yeah, this is much more of a boxing match than what we anticipated, Berkeley. The feigning of these throws and backing up, being able to throw these punches hard and know when to throw your punches is coming effective. Garchomp with a Deadeye kill. Hammer's gonna respond with a kill on Webslinger before Webslinger gets the kill on Garchomp. It's 50-50 back and forth. And if Converse wants to take the point, they have to position themselves now to do it before RPI regains their defense in full force. Yeah, Converse has the spawns here despite being down one after that fight. Tevatron shatters there just to make some space. With Z Hobo though, the fire strike and the damage from the bat is able to find a couple kills. And now Converse, they've got to back off fast and get back in. Hopefully for one more fight or it's all over. I imagine the series will keep surprising us, Berkeley, but I gotta say I did not anticipate a full hold from RPI here. If they're able to pull it off, they've got a touch point. That's gonna be Quicks touching with the Wrecking Ball. Just in the nick of time, they get it. Hammer drops the hammer. The rip tire finds a pair. That could be what they need. They've gotta get it done with the ball carb. Orion and Kiwi both get a pair of kills. And just at the buzzer nuke, there's going to be no full hold in this match. Converse finally awarded with the objective. And that's the sort of accolade that breeding, or bringing a new tank or a character to the table can do for your team, Berkeley. I don't think RPI was expecting the Wrecking Ball. They knew that they were gonna have to get back to point quick and fight, but after you've had a Reinhardt in your face for four or five minutes, you're not expecting the Wrecking Ball to come through, get the knock up and get a quick kill on your Baptiste. That's exactly what happened and how Converse was able to take the point. So I'd like to see a little bit more adaptive hero switching coming out from these teams. And if something's not working, we would just switch and try something new. I'm a little surprised to still see the Wrecking Ball, but as long as they can make it work, why not? Don't reinvent the wheel here. Hammer doing all the heavy lifting right now with the Ant Matrix gets three kills and the Marty Dom finds Hobo. Yeah, that Marty Dom can be uh, dangerous if you're not ready for it, Berkeley. 
Yeah, most annoying perk in Call of Duty 4. Um, <laughs> and here it is in Overwatch, causing some more headaches. Speaking of headaches, Webslinger has this dead eye. Yeah, speaking of web, <laughs> speaking of headaches, Webslinger has this dead eye and not afraid to use it. But that's going to be Garchomp pushing up and getting this Blizzard off to allow for more space. Because realistically, Converse does not need to make to the second point here, right, Berkeley? They just have to get it within meters of this point. Yeah, just seven more meters, in fact, until they have this map wrapped up. It looked like they were going to get full held, but the attackers came alive with a wrecking ball. Wow. Thanks to Quicks getting on the point in a clutch fashion. Converse now lead the series two to zero. That one was a nail biter. It had twists and turns all the way through, but Converse get the dub. And literally flipping on its head in the last minute of the game, Berkeley. It just goes to show the effect that you can staggering a team can have that's exactly what converse did you gave them an inch they continued with that inch and they put you behind for the rest of the game and here we got quicks going two for two in the match on play of the games the main tank for converse the only tank for converse really stepping into the battle of this game not afraid of anything on the side of rpi pushing the aggression and rewarded time after time nuke what are your thoughts on map two before we jump into a quick break map two is beautiful berkeley i love the back and forth that we're seeing today in both of these teams rpi although they're down 0-2, do not show it whatsoever on this field they are going step for step tit for tat against converse and i am thrilled to see whether the janitor's coming in this game or we're going to see the janitor come in after a couple more games in this series either way berkeley we'll be back to find out what happens after this short break
Welcome back everyone, I'll charge here alongside Nuclear, and this game is not disappointed, it's 2-0 right now, Converse is up, but last map on King's Row was so interesting, New Converse, their attack looked like it was just in a slumber to start things off, they were getting full held, made their way onto the point in overtime, and they end up winning the entire map. Now they're on match point, Nuke, do you think RPI answer here as we head to Rialto next? I think it's do or die time, Berkeley, and it's a matter of whether your team breaks or succeeds under pressure if rpi is the type of team to say yeah we've learned from the first two maps these are the changes we need to make going into the third i think they could bring this back in a full reverse sweep fashion however if the mental is down after the first two games and they feel a little battered converse university might have this series in the bag and even if Converse do win, just as someone who casted this division a lot in the fall and actually had like a show that followed this division specifically, RPI won no games in the fall. They really weren't that competitive. This team looks transformed just over winter break. This is a totally different RPI than the RPI that was playing in the fall. This team has upped their level of competition tremendously, and I'm so happy to see that. Oh, yeah. we The first two games have shown that tremendously they may be 0-1 in record and by the end of this series they could be 0-2 but i don't think that this is a team that we don't catch in playoffs I, I think this is a playoffs level team and they're showing that they have it to be in the legends division they're scrapping hard berkeley they really are scrapping hard i mean we had eight teams in Legends in the fall, expanding to 19 teams, more than doubling. And I think RPI is definitely in the top half of Legends, at least how they're playing in the first couple weeks. They faced Redbirds. They went 0-1. You know, can't really slight them too much for going 0-3 against Redbirds. Everyone does that. Converse even got 0-3'd by Redbirds. And now up against Converse, even though they're down 0-2, Converse in the fall was a fantastic team in this division, and RPI has hung with them on both maps so far. Yeah, you mentioned Berkeley a little bit ago that Garchomp was one of the best Overwatch high school players in the nation on DPS. And when he they came in last year, on they moved them to tank. And we saw Garchomp a bit ago on, on healer. Now Garchomp is back to the tank role. And I think that's a statement from Converse Berkeley saying, we're here, we're going to end this series, we want to go home, we want to get dinner, we are shutting and locking the door, the janitor's not coming in later, he's staying now, and we're getting this sweep. I think Garchomp was actually the Cassidy, he was just, like it wasn't DPS, DPS, tank, support, support, I think he was where Orion was, but uh, I think he was playing deeps, but I was confused about that too, because in my notes gotcha, I wrote him gotcha. on support as well. One. But yeah, gotcha. no, like, Either like you were way, saying, Converse yeah, the want to end huge. this. They're on the ball comp, they're playing Somber Tracer, they're looking to get active. They are, and notice, we're seeing a lot of changes going into this map on Rialto, Berkeley. Complete compositional changes on both sides. Yeah, a ton. I mean, we're playing Dive Overwatch now. This is totally different than what we saw on King's Row in Nepal, where it was Rhine comps every single point we played. Now, Converse knows that they just had a great round of King's Row on Wrecking Ball that started in overtime, and they want to see if they can get that to work designing a full comp around it. And this is why I love the variety in dive compositions in Overwatch 2, Berkeley. You're running dive in Overwatch 1, and it is the same Tracer, Winston, Genji composition game to game. But here in Overwatch 2, we got a Wrecking Ball on one team, we got Sojourn, Filling the DPS role. We have an Ana on both sides, but we have a Z or Orion on the Zenyatta and Shupak over on the uh, Kiriko. We're seeing a lot of variety in these compositions and them both being a dive composition. Yeah, tons of differences in these two teams. Converse right now, the ball comp looks just as good as it did on King's Row where they didn't lose a fight with it. I think now that they have their DPS and Orion designed around the Wrecking Ball, it's going to be so effective at just diving Z-Hobo like that. Hammer sticks the Pulse Bomb. Shupak is a little bit vulnerable without the Swift Step and the Cleanse, but honestly, this Converse comp, as long as they backpedal well and stay out of RPI's dive, they should respond faster every single fight. I think so too, Berkeley. And and notice, Garchomp is not on tank like we anticipated. Garchomp is going to be um, on the... Oh my gosh. Help me out here. Sombra. On the Sombra. How could I... I, I wanted to say... 
<laughs> Apaganda Las Luces, which is turn off the lights. But on the Sombra will be Garchomp, and I'm telling you, that ultimate could be a huge game changer for this team. Yeah, right now Converse hasn't had to stress too much. Oh, they're trapping Tevatron with the mines. Ooh. That is some dirty play by Quicks. Just calling out Tevatron's dive and saying, you're not leaving, dude. You're stuck right here with me in my minefield. Wow. That's very cheeky. <laughs> Man. Yeah, I love how they set up, too. Sorry to cut you off there, but high ground oh, every yeah. time. Like, they're setting up this dive to just get on the back line without having to take any damage on their way in. They are. And... Speaking of taking damage on the way in, that's going to be an EMP coming out from Garchomp and a quick slam from Quicks trying to find a couple of kills. They're going to find it in the in, in the fashion of both of the healers on the side of RPI, and that leaves RPI no chance but to regroup. And this is definitely the best Converse has looked all night. I think we can all see it. We're three minutes into this game, and the payload has only progressed 75 meters. Uh... For those of you good at some quick math, that's almost as much distance as it would take to round the bases in baseball. Fun. You know... Oh, sticky. Nice cleanse! Shoe pop. You know what else is fun? Having a full econ if you're RPI. Kitsune Rush has popped, and they are moving in. This team realizes they need to make it through. That's going to be Orion with the Transcendence trying to keep the rest of the roster alive. Tevatron diving the back line once more. The Primal Rage was popped a little bit ago, so Tevatron not having that in the back pocket, but it's not going to matter as RPI is on their way to taking this point. What's that, though? That's a minefield on the payload that could spell trouble for Converse. And it's spread er, out RPI. so, so well. RPI has the Nano Blade that they can use. Orion's not alive, doesn't have the Transcendence anyway. RPI should be able to get this point, but it was a sloppy road to the finish line here on checkpoint number one. And they finally get it two and a half minutes back up on the clock. Converse still look like they're in control of this map, but now RPI, they've got a little more light in the lantern. This is going to be a very long two and a half minutes, Berkeley. They have got to make this time work for them. they got to stay on this payload, because if they get staggered once or twice, that's going to spell the end of this map for RPI. Converse setting up once more for their defense. And we're going to hear the Dragon Blade popped in the back line. Yeah, Nano Blade comes out. No one on Converse stands a chance there without Transcendent. Web Slinger cuts up Converse easily, and the payload keeps pushing. Yeah, and notice as well, we didn't mention it earlier, but Shupak also transitioning over to Brigitte instead of the Kiriko. Not sure if I agree with that, but hey, this is the Legends Division team. Maybe the thought process is we need to get quick killing off in the back line. Web Slinger and Bot Boy aren't getting it enough. That's going to be an EMP, though, to set up for this fight. Converse retaliating quickly. Yeah, the Sleep Dart and the EMP just catches the dive of RPI completely unaware. They weren't ready to take that much damage so fast. And this is where Rialto is one of the toughest maps in all of Overwatch. Crossing this bridge, you're going into a hotel that just gives the defenders a free high ground for the, the entire rotation to the objective. It's almost impossible to actually set up an attack from here. So Converse getting the stop is massive. I think they have complete control of the rest of the round. I think they do too, Berkeley, because RPI is, uh, with this dive composition, going to need need to regroup and attack the back line, which is so hard to do when you're changing elevations, going up and in that hotel. Still Kiwi finding the pick on Web Slinger, though, and that's going to be Hammer with Nano Boosted, looking for a couple of kills, running through the back line like a rhino. Horns out, taking out everyone on the way and sending RPI back to the bases. Berkeley, it's not looking too great for RPI. No, it's not. And this is what losing control of the payload in this point of the map does. You just go into that high ground and it just feels like it's futile every single time. Right now, we don't even have Converse defending it. They're defending with their dive comp in the open space, closing those RPI members in the back line off completely. They did get Tevatron to the point for free, but now it's going to be a one versus three. Can the Wrecking Ball do it? Has the support as reinforcements now, but it might be too little too late. Overtime's already burning. Uh, and nothing's a bigger dopamine boost than falling low in your... Uh, Resident Zenyatta popping the Transcendence. Unfortunately, that's also going to be an EMP followed up. An RPI hacked to death. 
with their last stand being Web Slinger on point. Bot Boy may make it back, but RPI pushing up until the second point. Converse now has their win condition, Berkeley, and all they gotta do is hit the pedal to the metal and outdo RPI's push. Yeah, I mean, RPI, it looked like they were going to get full health, and now they have a legit win condition, just like they did on King's Row. They nearly held Converse to the first point of King's Row. They just need another Good. stellar defense here, and they've got this map in the bag. They're back in the series, but... The boys in Periwinkle Blue, our blue team, Converse, looked so good on that dive comp for so long. I think they can get it together and win the match right here. I think so too, Berkeley. It's going to be a matter of their endurance in the series. They've stayed on top the whole time, but even one slight slip could send us in the other direction. You know, I would also say holding on King's Row... I think is probably a little bit easier than holding on Rialto in the sense that you got the Maywalls, you got the Rhine shields, you can just hold your corners. And they were able to first hold point for quite a while, but I feel they're going to have a little bit more of a challenge uh, with Converse pushing, pushing through on this dive composition. And Converse playing the Sombra and maybe Hammer sticks to the Widowmaker. They're playing yeah. for picks on the squishies that RPI is just going to have a really tough time peeling for. Garchomp especially can close on to Z Hobo on the Zen totally free. So somehow yep. RPI has to defend their Zenyatta incredibly well against a very talented team. And Zenyatta finds a lot of value in the orbs that Zen is able to throw out. And being hacked, Zen is a sitting duck. So all Garchomp has to do is find the hack hammer has to find the angle, and that could be the entire RPI backline. As we say that, Orion is going to find a pick on Webslinger to kick us off on this push. Webslinger actually got hacked right there before Orion got that kill. Garchomp was just hanging out, not flank Sombra, just sticking with the team, waiting for Webslinger to pop out. Got the hack and a 150 HP tracer with no blinks available. That's dead meat. Already, too, Converse pushing it further in this one minute than RPI did in the first three minutes entirely of this game. So it's showing very uh, a high promise for Converse going into the series. Ult economy is about the same on either side, but if Garchomp's able to rack up this EMP faster than RPI is able to get anything online, that's going to be a, a pretty interesting fight with Converse taking the lead. RPI did do a great job there slowing that last fight down, getting a couple of picks and being able to set up the defense again. But now, how do you defend Z Hobo? Shupak gets a little bit of peel in there, but Quicks comes in from the off angle and is able to finish the kill. Converse is at the advantage 5v4, make it 5v3. Both supports now down for RPI. You've got to back up. You have one chance left at defending this point, and it's going to be with just a meter to go. Yeah, and now RPI finds themselves between a sticky situation and a tough wall. Because if they make changes here, they're going to lose alt economy. But they may need to make changes in order to counter what Converse is throwing at them. So it's a tough situation to be stuck in. RPI have a couple of their support ultimates online. Will it make a difference? Yeah, they don't continue the hold here on first, but z Hobo, you were talking about the value that Zen can bring. Zen is an insane glass cannon. We just saw z Hobo put it on display right there. But as I'm looking at the alt economy, RPI, they're getting low on resources. Converse has everything in their bank. And this is the part of the map where you need to set up a good defense if you're RPI. You've got to lock this down oh, no. and use the strongest part of your map to the advantage. Right now, it's four versus four. Bot Boy and Garchomp go down. Garchomp, I'm pretty sure, threw the translocator into the water, forgetting that he can't swim. Yeah, Gar Garchomp says I lagged school Wi-Fi. We'll see. Uh, that's going to be a nano boosted hammer, dropping it down on the other team. Converse looking to continue to push their lead here and doing so in a great fashion as they're going to take two off the front line of RPI and the rest of the back line is going to get hit with a massive EMP from Garchomp. This is Hammer. Look at this positioning in this hotel, Berkeley, on the far end of the hotel where it's very hard to see Hammer, but looking to find these angles is Converse is pushing RPI back through the point. 
Yeah, Hammer's up there calling all RPI challengers to try and take that space back. Anyone that Hammer's able to draw up there is away from the payload. That helps Converse push. Botboy actually gets a very good pick there onto Quicks. I don't know if Converse can get this done at this stage in the map without their tank. RPI need to press this advantage, get a good fight, a clean one in, so they can set up their defense on next. Yeah, a bit of an awkward dead eye coming out from Hammer. And that's going to be Bot Boy throwing Bob in a very peculiar position over in the corner to get him as much range and sight as possible because there's really nowhere to go from there, Berkeley. They're going to have to take an awkward angle to get away from Bob. Oh, Shoepok not afraid of our boy Hammer. The whip shot sends Hammer all the way back to spawn and RPI. They know this is the part of the map they've got to defend with their life. The Nano Boost goes on to Garchomp. A little bit too late, though. Garchomp goes down to a flurry of headshots from Z Hobo. Quickly traded out as Quix is able to find that kill. Two and a half minutes left for Converse to get the job done, but I don't believe it's going to happen this fight. Yeah, RPI was able to hold their Berkeley, but it, it looked a little sloppy. They were able to find individual picks here and there. Converse, really, that's the first time this entire map that they've been stopped. Now, we are going to hear the Brigette alt get popped. Grig's going to move in with the rally, trying to get the rest of the troops. And that's going to be a Transcendence to follow suit as well, hopefully stopping the payload as Quicks has made their way around and is pushing it as a one-man army. Oh, Quick says it ends right here, right now. Z Hobo trying to make a final stand, but for just how long ends up going down as Quicks rolls through and Converse get the 3-0 sweep here in match number one. And what a beautiful masterclass in positioning and coordination from Converse. Just finding these angles where RPI was not expecting it whatsoever. And that's how you grow, grow in this game, Berkeley. You have these adaptive strategies. You're ready to pop out at a moment's notice. Great play from Webslinger on the side of RPI taking the play of the game. But that'll be Converse taking the match. You saw Shoepok and Match Chat at the end put a little respect on it, said you guys are so good to Converse because, yeah, they really just kind of elevated their play once they went over to Dive Comp. It was all Brawl for Maps 1 and 2, and then Converse had that trick up their sleeve the entire time. The Dive Comp was so clean from Converse. Happy to see that team work so well on two different comps, but hats off to RPI. I mean, coming out of the fall, it looked like they weren't going to be competitive in this division. Converse is a team near the top, and RPI was right in there. It made this a very interesting series, despite it still being a 3-0. Oh, absolutely. It was very back and forth. Converse didn't sweep any of those maps whatsoever. They may have, you know, swept the individual points on control, but they didn't sweep any of the maps. RPI was there tit for tat every single fight, and now it brings me to the 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 best part of our broadcast berkeley who you got for player of the match oh man that's actually a really <laughs> tough one in this match um i want to say garchomp but i'm going with quicks the main tank play the game on maps one and two was just so stellar on the reinhardt and a big factor of this dive being so good is quicks definitely saying when and where he's slamming on the wrecking ball. Quicks actually got back onto the King's Row point in overtime on ball to clutch it out, stayed on a wrecking ball, and then they were flawless from there. So Quicks is my guy tonight. In very rare form, Berkeley, I think that we are unanimous in our decision. Ooh. I would have also chosen Quicks for player of the match. You absolutely hit the nail on that. Quicks was there every turn and honestly just out playing rpi when they're not expecting it the sneaky earth shatter kills the ability to make it back on point as ball in king's row and at the very end forcing rpi back on point with that dive composition made converse a pave a way to victory so quicks has got to be my player of the match as well I can't believe we agree. It took us three weeks of casting this season. I think we've done six games so far. We finally agreed. Quicks just had one of those performances where it was undeniable tonight. It doesn't happen without good support. It doesn't happen in dive comp without great DPS coordinating with you. But Quicks was a playmaker tonight, so very well deserved. Nuke and I are actually going to be back for match two in just around 45 minutes. That's all for this matchup between Converse and RPI. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you want to see us again, come back in 45, and we'll see you then.
Hello friends and welcome to tonight's Champions Central Division matchup. It's Overwatch 2, Bethel Pilots taking on the Cumberland Phoenix. I'm Berkeley Stevens, joined as always by Chase Newcomb, and we're excited to bring you all the action live. Chase, both of these teams are coming into tonight 2-0, and that is not going to stand at the very end, so we can expect an intense battle in this matchup. And Chase, as we look ahead, about to get in, what do you think is going to be the biggest challenge for both of these teams tonight, and how do you see them overcoming it? Well, Berkeley, if you're speaking from a literal sense, the biggest challenge may be a May wall, and to overcome it, you know, I would recommend either a Baptiste jump or a Symmetra teleporter. In all seriousness, though, if uh, they go into this match, I think the biggest challenge is going to be themselves. That's what we've seen time and time again at the Champions Division. This is on the cusp of really being at the highest level that you can be in Overwatch. And I'm telling you, Berkeley mentality runs rampant at this point in overwatch so i think it's going to be a matter of their mentality both towards each other on their team and how they take these games you bring up a good point though both of these teams are 2-0 the only differential that we're able to see between the two teams is bethel pilots won 3-0 against siue black in the first week and last week cumberland phoenix won against siue black as well but they won 3-1 meaning siue black took one game off of the cumberland phoenix does that give the pilots an advantage? It may. Yeah, I don't know. It might give them the slightest favoritism on paper, but it's just bound to be a good one between these two teams. These are always some of the front runners in the division that they always share. They've shared the same division, I think, for four semesters in a row in the NECC. So these are pretty much parallel programs that are always fun to spectate, and I'm glad we get to watch them tonight for match number two. Uh, talking about the starting lineups, let's kick it off here with the Bethel Pilots first, and I'll rattle this one off. It's a fun one. If you're familiar with Super Smash Brothers or the Nintendo scene, you know all of these. We've got Daisy. We've got Shy Guy, Goomba, Waluigi, and Peach on support. Very fun squad. Can't wait to cast those battle tags. Should be a blast. Chase on the side of Cumberland Phoenix. What are we looking at? On the side of Cumberland Phoenix, we're seeing Leon Master, Tamaki, Hemlock, Killa, and Gil. You're absolutely right as well, Berkeley. That is a fun lineup. It's a them. They're here and they're ready to go in World 1-1. What's funny as well, what the, the folks at home can't see, Berkeley, is that their bench player is Diddy Kong, which is funny because that is the one character that isn't inherently from the Mario universe like the other five on the main roster lineup. So nerding out a little bit on this end, but Cumberland Phoenix as well, not to uh, shake a finger at their names, they have some pretty good names on their lineup as well. Yeah, they do. This is overall just going to be a very fun game to yell and shout about, so I can't wait to get into it. Uh, as we start, we do have a pick ban system here. The first map that was banned for control was Busan, and we're headed to Lijiang Tower. That's going to be our battleground for map number one. Different than the first game we saw. In game one, that was a Legends Division game. We headed to Nepal first. I would say Lijiang Tower is quite a bit different than Nepal. Chase, what can we expect to see? Well, Lijiang Tower, well, I, I would hope to see some Symmetras on this map. Last time we were on control a little bit ago, we were at Nepal, like you were mentioning, Berkeley, and surprisingly, there were none to be found. At this division, though, in the Champions Division, I think that that's going to be a very popular hero pick. And in a map structure like Lijiang, there's so many points and so many opportunities to get those turrets in the sneakiest of positions so that when you get to point, you're on the other end of a Symmetra laser. Yeah, I think right now in the meta, Symmetra is definitely not best, but there are those control points where she's almost necessary. And I think Li Zhang has a couple of those in Gardens and Night Market. She's been a staple for years at this point, so I would expect to see her as well. But a lot of Cole Cassidy tonight, maybe some Reinhardt's here to kick things off on control. That's what we saw in Nepal was these brawly compositions, usually with a Mei as well. Uh, but let's just get right into it let's kick off lijiang tower it's about to be underway 15 seconds until teams pick their comps and give us our first look at what they're going to play tonight yeah and this first point control center we actually may not see some metro this is more of a a brawl composition we could see some maze some reinhardt's but time will tell. As I say that, Shy Guy, we're going to see on the Reinhardt, while Luigi will be on the Meg Goomba on the Cole Cassidy, Daisy on the Baptiste, and Peach 
on the Lucio on the side of the Cumberland Phoenix. They will be taking the tactic I mentioned earlier. Is Tomaki going to make their way over to the Symmetra? Gil will be on the Cole Cassidy. Killa going to take a note out of Shy Guy's book as well, run the Reinhardt, and then the support lineup is going to be the same on the Cumberland Phoenix. As I rattled all those names off, off it looks like Goomba is making some last-minute changes. Uh, hesitated, looking at the Symmetra for a second. Going to decide on the Cole Cassidy. Yeah, a little bit surprised to see Tamaki play this sim here, but it does get Cumberland to the fight first. And they've got the turret set up already to make Shy Guy think twice about stepping foot into the fray. Cumberland right now holding the high ground and holding the pilots at bay. But for how long is that going to last? Tamaki's turrets were already dealt with. Cumberland has to retreat to the far side of the point. And now Bethel have a good spot to engage from. Just have to keep their members alive. Goomba and Waluigi pretty low, but Daisy supporting the team well from the back line. This fight, though, starting to spill onto the objective. The Reinhardt's beginning to clash like a couple of freight trains. And Tamaki's got the level 3 beam starting to microwave the front line of the pilots. Only able to find one before falling to Shy Guy. We've got a 4 versus 3 now as Cumberland find another, but with Killer removing Shy Guy as well, there's no tanks left. If you want to buy space, it's going to cost a pretty penny. Berkeley, that is one of the fastest amplification matrixes that we've seen in all of the champions divisions. We were halfway through the first fight and that was immediately popped by Daisy on the side of the Vessel Pilots. They did take the high ground and it looked like it was gonna be their fight to lose for a second there. Cumberland Phoenix was able to regroup in time and push the pilots off the point. However, I did like the pilots' positionings. They were just kind of at a loss pushing into Tamaki on that Symmetra. It's just too strong on this point. Well, now they're not going to have to worry about Tamaki for this upcoming fight. Gil popping the dead eye. Oh, and finds Goomba trying to peek out as well. That is a cheeky kill that I'm sure Gil was not expecting to find. I was thinking the pilots would back off for a bit. Now they step into it, though. The shatter comes down. It lands, but Shy Guy pays for it, extending just a tad too far into the front line. And now Killa can step forward freely and just thwart off the pilot's push. Leon Masta dropping a beautiful immortality field as well. As Shy Guy was hitting the dash, the charge kill on Killa wasn't quite able to find the namesake and the Cumberland Phoenix will hold. This is 50% looking great as an Earth Shatter batters the backline of the pilots. Bethel sending back to the spawn room and not what we anticipated so far, Berkeley. The pilots are stuck on the back foot and the Phoenix rise again as they are pushing the pilots back onto the landing strip. Yeah, I would expect this game to end up getting a lot closer than it is right now. It's been the Cumberland Phoenix show to this point. Now the Phoenix in some trouble though. The Blizzard, the Maywall, the Deadeye, everything is going right for the pilots here. They are bound to take the objective now. Just a little bit of cleanup work here and there before they claim it. I loved that Deadeye shot as well coming out from Goomba. It was not meant to kill the rest of the team. It was mainly meant to clean up and they were able to get three shots fired off. That all but secures the uh, Phoenix needing to regroup so the pilots can take the point. Great positioning play from Goomba. Now, the pilots do have uh, their sound barrier online for Peach, and it may be enough to stop Gil's Deadeye, which is going to pop to kick off this fight. Yeah, and the Deadeye is going to buy a little bit of time for the attackers here. They try and TP it sneakily. They're going to claim the point for this, actually. That wow. was a nice teleporter. Completely backed Bethel off the objective. Cumberland got a fast switch over to the control. Now the beat drop has to be sent out by Peach as she tries to support the front line. Shy Guy's nearing an Earth Shatter. Needs to get it quick, though, and land a big one. Knocked awfully low. Removed from the fight by Hemlock, in fact. And now it's Cumberland trying to end round one right here. Tamaki fries two in the back line, and that is going to dust it. Wow. And backing up, one of the most overpowered things you can do in Overwatch, but Bethel Pilots Berkeley backing up a bit too far. Cumberland Phoenix with a great positioning play is going to secure them the first point in Li Zhang Tower. Yeah, that was such a crafty Sim TP Deadeye to just buy the objective, just an instant switch with no contest from Bethel. I mean, that craftiness from Cumberland just got them round one. Yeah, absolutely. And I love to see 
Cumberland playing things a bit different, you know, shaking it up. It's like we talked about in the previous cast over at the Legends Division last match, Berkeley. If you're able to be crafty, like Converse was against RPI, you're just going to keep them on the back foot the entire series. And so far, that's what Cumberland is showing for Bethel. Bethel's just going for some straightforward Overwatch and Cumberland trying to play 4D chess over here. Yeah, now it looks like Bethel has the more four-dimensional comp as they spread things way out with this Wrecking Ball Pharmacy dive strat they've got going on. Cumberland is going to be turning their heads every which way. Sticky Grenade removes Goomba from the fight, but the Bethel pilots can get a lot done here despite dropping one member. They come back quick with Waluigi taking down Tamaki, and now it's anyone's game. Four versus four. Gil trying to poke out, is able to find Peach up in the skies. Now just has to remove Waluigi as well, who doesn't stand a chance without the Mercy Pocket. Gil was fishing around to find the princess in the right castle and will find their marks on the right one. Daisy getting a cheeky kill on Leon Master and the point is still in the favor of the Cumberland Phoenix. Man, if I'm on the pilots and I'm the shot caller, I'm calling for everyone to back up, get out, don't get staggered, and we will re-engage when we group up. Shy Guy will find a kill on Gil, which could sway things back in the favor of the pilots. Pilots regrouping so well right here. Shy Guy's been in the fight seemingly the entire time. Daisy slowly working their way in the barrage from above. Waluigi's able to do a ton of damage. Leon Master can't live through it. And now it looks like Bethel, they get the point for the first time. They still have a trance, a sticky grenade. Peach coming up with the Valk. Bethel has a ton of alt economy to hold this down for a while. As Nuke may be muted, I will say Cumberland Nuke, comes Nuke into me. this point with a dead eye. Goomba Sticky Grenade takes down the Immortality Field. Goomba actually dies for that play. Leon Master Pop in the Ant Matrix. That should be enough for Cumberland to actually get this point back, and they do. They get the flip, they should be able to defend it. I'm surprised that they were able to get the flip, Berkeley. As you mentioned a bit ago, the pilots had the favor in the alt economy. Hemlock had dropped the sound barrier previously, and unfortunately, it was right at the tail end of the fight, and they weren't able to hold on to point. But if we're saying anything from the Cumberland Phoenix, it's that they're able to hold control. And I think it's playing around Killa so well. The pilots, though, are doing a fantastic job, as you mentioned, Berkeley, of backing up and regrouping and making these plays fast, quick, to the point, as we're seeing the minefield on, the low, on point, and we are moving into the fight. And Gil takes Waluigi right out of the skies with the dead eye there. Trying to work their way in through the minefield now as Shy Guy laid out a good one, but it seems like Cumberland have navigated it well. They're defending the point, just 15% left until Beth will get the cap here, but they're having trouble actually getting the rest of that objective in their hands. Daisy right now in some trouble, having to pop the transcendence and get to some safe space. We do have four pilots back into this fight. Waluigi on top of the point, raining rockets from above. Killa has to slam down Goomba, taking him out of the fight, but now it looks like the pilots are still going nowhere. They don't have the objective in their control, and Cumberland has 99%, so if Beth will take this with just the barrage and the mines coming up online, they still have to hold this for a full minute. Yeah, and if we've learned anything from that fight, Berkeley, it's that Killa was able to force out Daisy's transcendence just by running at Daisy. So if the Cumberland Phoenix is able to put some pressure on the Zenyatta player for the pilots, that could spell some trouble for the pilots in the skies. Some rocky turbulence, if you will. Shy Guy looking to take the fight off of point, pushing a pick onto the Cumberland Phoenix before they're even able to make it on two point. Oh, you don't want to get stuck in this room here going up against a minefield. Now you don't have a tank either. Ant Matrix comes out. They try to burst down Shy Guy, but Shy Guy actually gets the last lap there. The minefield is just in too good a spot. The Phoenix can't move through it. That's going to be the Phoenix trying to push with the two that they have, though, Berkeley. And these uh, two to three person grouping up trying to take point maneuvers um, don't seem to be working very well for either side. We saw the pilots try to do it a bit earlier. Cumberland Phoenix falling short, and that's going to be the pilots now at 82%. If they're able to hold once more, they could secure the second point. And Cumberland now goes over to 
pretty much a mirror composition, except for Leon Masters on the Kiriko instead of the Zenyatta that Daisy's playing. And this composition is going to be way better at fighting in overtime as we start to stall out this point in just a couple of seconds. It's a four versus four. Cumberland is missing their Farah. Bethel Pilots are missing their Zenyatta. Res back up into the action by Peach. Thank you very much, Peach. Looks like Bethel is going to hold this one down and send us into a point three, but Cumberland, they're still hanging around on the point, and overtime usually takes quite a while to tick down on this objective. We'll see if Cumberland gets back in. They've got just a second to do it. Gil can't make it. Very close, Gil on the cusp of glory, but that will be a 1-1. The pilots evening out Li Zhang Tower and scrapping their way back into the game. It, Cumberland Phoenix pretty convincingly took control center but on that second point, Berkeley, the pilots were scrapping back. It was a little bit more of a fight on the end of the pilot's side. I think it's pretty unanimous what we're going to see on this point. I think we're going to see a double symmetric composition. And if we don't, then I think the Phoenix are going to take this point pretty handily. This is uh, your common Symmetra point. There's so many places to put the turrets. You can get to point faster by TPing in the window. The Phoenix are setting themselves up for success. Yeah, the Phoenix, their strength is this Brawl composition. They will die on this sword. This is one of those 50-50 maps where if the Bethel play it, if the Bethel Pilots play it well, they could get away with this again. But I think Cumberland Phoenix, their strength being close quarters combat, they've got the edge here. Yeah, it looks like Bethel, as you mentioned, Berkeley, they're going to try to play around a point with this pharmacy and looking for some stray picks and kills before they go in and take the point. Fair and Mercy also not terrible picks on this point. I just think the Symmetra, once it's locked down, is harder to dethrone and you know, pull out of this area. Yeah, for sure. And Bethel on their way into the point. They lost Daisy. Cumberland just sent everything to get that kill early. The speed boost, the rhyme pin, everything was used just to make this one a five versus four fight. Cumberland got the objective first because of it, and they're having no trouble holding it through the first fight now. Yeah, this is an absolute mosh pit on point as well. Bethel Pilots, we saw Shy Guy roll through point and lose half their health almost immediately. Just the raw damage that the Phoenix are able to pump out is almost too much for the Pilots to be able to sustain. Shy Guy making it out by the teeth of his mouth on that point and barely making it end. We're seeing Goomba in the back line on this Tracer trying to get a little bit of percent. That's going to be halfway through taking point. If the pilots are able to capitalize here, that could be a huge switch. Immortality Field comes out to defend against the mines, but it's not there to defend against the Pulse Bomb. Goomba sticks that one and it had two names written on it, Leon Master and Gil sent back to spawn. Now it looks like the Bethel Dive is going to find some success, hopefully rewarded in the end with the point, and they will be. They make the fight clean. Still though, Cumberland, they take more than 50%. Pretty good job holding it first. That's the beauty of these dive compositions as well, Berkeley, is being able to force fights necessarily where the other team doesn't want to fight, right? We saw Shy Guy spin around the statue outside of point. It pulled the rest of the Phoenix out. Ooh, we're seeing a barrage popped by Waluigi. <laughs> Gonna find Tamaki in the back line and secure this defense for the pilots. The strategy seems to be working out for them now that they're on the defensive side. And they definitely know how to go into open space to proc their defense and then retreat after they try and find picks out there to defend the point. I think that is the way they have to play. If they were to use this right. composition to just defend on point, it'd be futile. Right, it's it's a that's why they're using the dive composition. They're, it's more guerrilla warfare, picking and uh, prodding where they can find a, an advantage, taking out the phoenix, um, and then capitalizing on that. That high noon, the dead eye could find both of the pharmacy duo. Unfortunately, not going to find them though, and that's going to be a transcendence pop by Daisy to keep the rest of the pilots in the air. Daisy does go down. That's going to be the first pick in this fight. Shy Guy has another minefield online. Oh, and Cumberland are all quartered. They try their best to live through it, but Shy Guy puts the mines in a perfect spot, and you just can't navigate that at all. Everything was just surrounded by damage. Yeah, that minefield was all across the opening to the point. Cumberland Phoenix were sort of cornered by the pilots in their positioning there. The pilots as well using all of their ultimate economy. We're seeing it on both sides. Pretty much all ults are expended. The next ultimate coming up is going to be Waluigi's Barrage. And it's going to have to be huge 
for them to secure this. Four versus four fight. Two seconds for the pilots to touch, and they're able to get there in time. Little dog fight up in the skies. Waluigi nearly gets the kill onto Hemlock, but can't quite find it. Killa, in the meantime, takes down Daisy. Waluigi tries to barrage and win this dogfight outright. Needs to hit these directs. Trying to make a clutch play up in the sky. Shy Guy deals wow. the final damage, but the pilots lost Peach. Their far is without a pocket. And Hemlock is still at large. Killa and Tamaki on the point, wreaking havoc. The Cumberland Phoenix hold control. That's what happens when you take out half of that pharmacy, Berkeley. The Phoenix able to get into point just enough. The pilots, as you said earlier, are looking for the, more of these poking and prodding fights. And unfortunately, with Peach being down and Waluigi taking on the pharmacy by themselves, it unfortunately just took way too many resources to expend. The pilots running out of gas and Cumberland Phoenix taking the point. But what is this? Someone sneaking on? Gonna get halfway through? They got about 10 seconds, Berkeley. They gotta make a play. Oh man, the minefields again. Tamaki tries to blink through it, but Shaga had him in just the right spot. The entire objective is just engulfed in potential damage for the Bethel pilots. And I love this play from Hemlock. Popping the Val, keeping everyone supported from afar. Overtime's ticking down. Gil's able to barrage Waluigi, but Waluigi hits the direct onto Gil. And the dogfight is just traded out equally. Petrez is back, Waluigi, but at what cost? You want your mercy in this fight. Hemlock and Gil are now both back alive for the Phoenix. They're trying to just close out this round. It's 99-99. Overtime is ticking away. This one is still anyone's game new. Yeah, Daisy falling short, almost finally dying, but popping the transcendence to keep the rest of the pilots in the air. That's going to be Waluigi falling next to Cumberland Phoenix, picking up this point and probably going to take this round by taking out Shy Guy. There's no one left on the pilots to defend, and that is going to be the Cumberland Phoenix rising once again to take point number one in this best of five series in such a flashy fashion. And I love how their game plan, their plan A, was that Reinhardt brawl. And then they just threw it in the bin. They went to the ball mirror with the pharmacy, in fact. And then they came back after being down 99 to 40. And they clawed their way all the way back, winning the round. I mean, this is just phenomenal stuff from the Phoenix, able to just adapt and overcome in map one. Yeah, it was very close. The pilots... Like I said, going into that third point, it seemed as though they were scrapping pretty hard to be able to get in. And the Phoenix are making more adaptive changes in their tank line and support line than the pilots. And I think it just secured them the victory. However, like we talked about earlier in the Legends Division, Berkeley, showing your hand that early could be a bit detrimental. And the pilots have pretty much stuck to this dive composition the entire series. But the Phoenix have now pulled out two different compositions that they've had to use to keep the pilots out at bay yeah i like how both teams i mean at one point both teams wanted to play brawl first and they wanted to play wrecking ball and win with the wrecking ball comp so i think we have a very even match on our hands and in the pick band system if you're cumberland you probably want to pick those brawl maps because that seems to be how they like to play but you also have to remember you just won on the dive comp so you can feel pretty much comfortable anywhere for map two it's an exciting time to be on the cumberland phoenix in this match very much and as we're Getting word in right now, Berkeley. Looks like we're going to get a ban from for Eichenwald. And so that means King's Row is going to be up. And if this has been a precursor to anything, we know these teams love playing King's Row. However, with both of these compositions playing more of a dive style, we could see a new body. Uh, it looks like we're actually going to be headed over to Blizzard World. I do like the pick. I feel like King's Row would have been a dangerous pick for Bethel just because that is the Brawl map. And Cumberland wanted to play Brawl first on every single point that we just saw on Lijang Tower. I think going to King's Row would have been dangerous. Blizzard World is a much better battleground for Bethel. Absolutely. They have the high ground and low ground going into that second point. The first point you can get around and play because it's very open, not closed off, and that's going to play well to their play style of this dive. Yeah, and let's not forget both of these teams undefeated so far 2-0 and as we're in the sure. week three of action here for Champions Division. And like you said in the pregame, Cumberland actually 3-1 a team, the only similar opponent between them and Bethel. Bethel got the 3-0 against SIUE Black. So Cumberland, they sneak out the first map. They're trying to go up in the series 2-0. After Blizzard World, if they're on match point, they're sitting pretty, but we know that this one's probably not going to be a sweep. 
Right. And, you know, not to diminish Bethel's uh, achievements, but last week they are 2-0, but last week their victory was a FF. So they're currently 3-0 in maps, whereas the Cumberland Phoenix are 6-1 in maps. And I think that means the Phoenix just have a little bit more experience in this NECC competitive play. And they're bringing it to the table tonight. It's inching out the pilots and the Phoenix are just barely able to stay on top. But as we progress through this series, Berkeley, more factors will begin to play such as endurance and mentality and how these players are able to maintain both because this is a best of five. We could be here for a bit if the pilots pop back off. And I like how we're getting this meeting so early on in the season between these teams because they will likely meet in the playoffs at the end of the spring semester. And there's going to be a ton of room between now and then where both of these teams are going to make tons of adjustments. So, I mean, this is not the end all be all for these programs. They would love to win today, but they will very likely meet again when it matters a lot more than it does tonight. Couldn't agree more, Berkeley. We're actually watching the Bethel Pilots on defense this time, so they're in the red. Don't let it fool you. Cumberland Phoenix in the blue. Bethel Pilots on the attacking end, and that's going to be Cumberland Phoenix on the defending end, huddling up around their Reinhardt like it's their only source of warmth, realizing they're up against a dive composition who will want to take them in 1v1 fights. This is a beautiful and well thought out play by the Phoenix to play the corner at this point behind their Ryan. Oh, <laughs> nice little slam, Caster's well curse. timed. Well timed by Shy Guy. I mean, not much you can do there. At some point, the pawns had to fall. Shy Guy just had excellent timing to dissect that huddled up Cumberland Phoenix squad. That's why you gotta make sure everyone's healed up. You, you can't, you can't just turn away and look away because that's exactly what Shy Guy capitalized on was waiting for that moment and diving in. Honestly, I w I'm, I'm a bit taken aback, Ber Berkeley. I thought that the Cumberland Phoenix are gonna hold that point a little longer. Yeah, I mean, they were playing it well. It just seemed like Bethel played the attack way better. They were so patient on that dive. There were such great comms. They knew when the damage was coming in and they knew that Shy Guy had to be the heavy right-handed hook that finished off the kill. That's exactly what happened. Killa making their way through the back line, sending Waluigi on a wild goose chase and uh, looking for a wide angle. That's what you love to see about these wrecking balls. They can make their way around these maps methodically hitting every health pack on the way and then finding your back line with no avail. Waluigi looking for a cheeky pulse bomb, but not finding the target. That's gonna be Peach raising, uh, raising ra Daisy from the dead. S sisters do and Gil getting the headshot on Waluigi will send Waluigi back to the spawn room the Cumberland Phoenix holding their or looking to hold their defense here and now we'll get to see this is what everyone is wondering on the new patch what is better is it the mercy pocketed Cole Cassidy or is it the mercy pocketed Ash that's been so strong since release of Overwatch 2 right now Gil is making Ash work so well here on the second point phase of Blizzard World but how long is that going to last? It's only a matter of time before Goomba starts to come alive. Ooh, and a well-placed dynamite in the side room will give Gil just the inch they need for Bob. Cumberland Phoenix have a beautiful alt economy on their side. Peach desperately trying to get out as Killa is barrading the front line. Man, Cumberland Phoenix have held in Berkeley. They've expended very little ultimates doing so. They just popped the Valkyrie from Hemlock but they still have Bob, they still have Minefield, and they still have the Nano Boost. And all the while, the payload has been progressing just inch by inch, but Cumberland knows that they just have to defend those last couple of meters. They can let it come all the way to the finish line of point two, just as long as they don't give it up at the very end. I like how they're utilizing the entire space that the Streets phase gives them, but they're coming down to the wire. They're about to be stressed off this high ground, and Hemlock falling there to Shy Guy is going to be the blood in the water that the Bethel pilots are hunting for. And Tamaki tries to send a pulse bomb out, but it just finds a staircase there. No kills confirmed. Tamaki actually in the back line, dove by Shy Guy, tracking down the tracer and not letting Tamaki out. Berkeley, this first point, if it's shown us anything, it's that the pilots are very comfortable with this dive composition, more so than the Phoenix. I think 
that is going to be their win condition is keeping the Cumberland Phoenix on this uncomfortable dive because if you're watching how they're playing at Berkeley, they are wanting to play it like a brawl composition. They're trying to group up, whereas Bethel are very confident and very comfortable about taking as wide of an angle as they need to find the picks in the back line. Yeah, Bethel love playing this comp in the open space. They're so good at it to this point of the game. And right now, if they are just guaranteed point two, they seal it up three and a half minutes on the clock now for the pilots to finish Blizzard World. And let's not forget, this was their map pick, so they are very ready to play this map on this composition. They look like a well-oiled machine so far. Agreed. Holistically, they know where the health packs are. You can see that in Waluigi's and Shy Guy's movements around the map. They know exactly where to take these off angles, and they are catching the Phoenix off guard. Not ready whatsoever for any of this damage coming through, but that's going to be Gillen Killa taking out both Peach and Goomba on the side of the pilots, halting this push for what seems for the first time in eternity. Yeah, it's been a minute, but this is what they needed. Set up the defense early here on this third point push. This is actually where the dive comp for Bethel gets a lot harder to use. Second point is just a wide open playground for dive comps, but now there's a roof over your heads. There's really only one flank you can take. It's not a 360 objective where you can just pretty much take any angle you want. I think now Bethel might run into some problems here. They could run into problems, but that's entirely dependent on the composition of the Phoenix Berkeley. If they continue this dive composition that's not working for them, they're just going to continue to be stuck as Goomba throws on the aim trainer in the background and hits body after body, sending the Phoenix back to the spawn room and regrouping to hopefully rise from their ashes and defend this, but it is looking sour for the Phoenix as the pilots continue their barrage from the air. Yeah, the pilots, they hit just a little bit of a speed bump here on point three, and since then they've gotten their act together beautifully. Goomba with a couple of headshots there. Waluigi sticks one to Leon Master, and it looks like the pilots mm. are going to finish this with well over the minute required to put the pressure onto the Phoenix. Um, a minute 43, and had they not hiccuped Berkeley, that could have very easily been a two-minute take for the pilots. The Phoenix are going to have to retaliate hard and fast if they want to make it back into Blizzard World, Berkeley. I think the pilots made a very safe and smart decision in picking this map. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, their dive comp looks so sound. If they could play on open maps all night long, I'm sure they would just be elated to, but we know that Without it being the standard map pools and it is pick band, Cumberland Phoenix have the ball in their court. And if they do lose Blizzard World here, I mean, they're probably going to pick a very close Corridors Escort map where Bethel might have some more trouble on. I would imagine that's their play. I'm sure that they've analyzed and dissected that play as such going into this what now third defense fourth defense in the series if you consider all the control points the phoenix are gonna have to regroup and they need to start asking reflective questions what is working what is not working what do we need to change and where is the miscommunication as well as miscoordination because the pilots are just beating us at every turn also notice now on the pilots we're, we're seeing a, a very cheeky name play a very cheeky character waluigi now going to be on the sombra on the defending pilots that's an interesting play berkeley yeah and in the legends game that we just casted before this converse who is one of the better collegiate teams in the entire scene uh they played the sombra with their wrecking ball they also played it coupled with a tracer to just really have those flanks dialed in for free playing it with the pocket ashes a lot more damage from the back line but we'll see if it's able to confirm as many kills well <laughs> let's hope so we're gonna see a hack come off in the back line hemlock unable to fly wings clipped for the time being leon master pushing up with killa killa on this diva could make a difference there is a lot of damage berating the back line but the phoenix i i just don't know if dive is the play i like that they're making changes and they're taking risks because that's ultimately how you're going to be adaptive well, they find Daisy on the high ground with no teammates in sight, and Killo, like a heat-seeking missile, removes the Zenyatta on the side of Bethel. 
And now there's some room here. Phoenix could be rewarded with the point. Hemlock with a nice little Glock kill there on the peak, but not before the resurrect on Waluigi comes through. Phoenix still struggling to get their foothold on this objective. They've taken a tick. They've got to get two more and make it fast. Hemlock literally said, hold up, wait a minute. Some may write. As they switched to the Caduceus Blaster, turned around and got a couple of quick shots off on Peach, sending them back to the spawn room. That was very fun. Uh, this this game as a whole, this series as a whole, has been very fun to watch and cast. Five minutes on the board now for the Phoenix as they begin their push, and they're going to have to be relentless if they want to make up time lost. Yeah, it has been fun. We're seeing some different stuff, too. Not your standard dive metas that we're kind of used to. Killa is just oh. walking this Phoenix team in with the defensive matrix, trying to peel for the back line and then launch themselves at weak targets on the side of the pilots. Attacking point two, there is a slep target up top. The Nano goes straight on to Killa and Gil. The Deadeye is there to remove Goomba. Shy Guy falls as well. Goomba's actually rezzed back up, but it might be too little too late as Killa continues to just rocket around this team and find kills everywhere. So those are some paired resources you don't nece necessarily see, but man, was that a deal of a kill for the Cumberland Phoenix expending the nano boost on D.Va because Leon Master said, hey, I hit the sleep. They're dead to rights if you're just able to hit the shots. Nanoing Killa so Nikilla can secure the kill and then finding two more is exactly what the Phoenix needed to push them ahead. But now finding themselves a bit on the back foot, they have 2.3 meters left to push. That is going to be pilots down one, but Peach using the res won't have that for the rest of the fight. So the Phoenix just have to find a little bit more value to inch this in. Pilots seem to have all the defensive resources they need here, though. The minefield is out. The Valkyrie is popped. Killa is out of the mecha suit. And now they can just take to the high grounds. Waluigi trying to find this kill onto Leon Master and does. Now into the back line goes Waluigi, taking down everyone. The Tracer cutting through the team like a sharp knife in surgery. <laughs> This is so fun to watch Berkeley and the team names make it all the more fun. Yes, Waluigi battering the back line as this tracer and the pilots hold for the time being, which any hold is a great hold for them on this defense because as long as they can keep the Phoenix under one minute, they'll continue the advantage. Heck, if they whole hold here, Berkeley, then the pilots just take this point or this map and we move on to the next one. Yeah, and if the Phoenix even get three points with no time on the clock, then Bethel is the only team with a win condition left. So getting it with a minute right. 43 is big. It's not just a good win condition by completing the map, but those of you who play Overwatch know that you hit zero seconds, you don't get an overtime if the other team has more than 60. So here, spilling into the next fight, Gil, Dead Eyes, that's able to take down Peach, but we are merciless in this fight as Hemlock goes down as well. The dive comp for Phoenix still trying to traverse their way through point number two. Bethel's lost their ash as well, but it looks like the defense can still hold here. Gil is removed by Daisy, and now it's anyone's game. Three versus three on the point, and the pilots have all the spawn advantages. Yeah, the pilots are going to make it back very fast too, but the Phoenix trying to push it in, utilizing the synergy between Killa and Tamaki. That's going to be the pulse bomb. Unfortunately, it's not going to find its mark, and the self-destruct's going to pop on point. Will it be enough? No. There will be a defense there in the form of Shy Guy, who also has the minefield on lock if they feel too pressured in this fight. Daisy taking to the skies and picking off Hemlock with the three round burst. That is uh, poetry at its finest. Cumberland Phoenix have now officially fallen underneath the time threshold that they need to complete the map. Obviously, if they take the point, they'll get a little bit of time back, but things are looking bleaker by the minute, Berkeley. Yeah, if Cumberland want to stay competitive on this map, they've got to take this point next fight. Find a way. You're going into a ton of alt economy for Bethel, so it doesn't seem like it's going to happen this fight. But we've seen miracles come to fruition before. Right now for the pilots, I mean, they're holding strong. This is the point they want to fight in all the time. This dive thrives in the open space. Waluigi trying to end the fight early with a pulse bomb, but that one misses the mark. Now going in trying to track down Killa, but can't quite catch up. Shy Guy in the oh. meantime, terrorizing the Cumberland Phoenix backline, moves in with the minefield to the point, and there should be no way that the Phoenix get a foot on. Yeah, and that's so unfortunate, Berkeley, because Hemlock just popped the Valkyrie to get the team in and keep them alive. Leon Master getting pressured, and I think at this point you have to ask yourself, is the Ana working or are we just giving them a target to dive every fight? 
I mean, you're definitely giving them a target that they want to dive the most. If Leon Master is not able to stay well defended or get into the fight quickly, I think what just happened in that last fight was the crux of this team where Leon Master, yeah, can defend themselves for a long time, but if they're not defending themselves close to the fight, then their actions per minute are just way down compared to what Daisy's doing. Always in the mix, in the front line, dealing damage from the back line, just right next to the action all the time. And now Bethel, they're just seconds away from closing out Blizzard World with a 3-1 win. And it looks like they're going to have no problem doing it. This series is tied up after two maps, one to one, and now Cumberland get the map pick, but Bethel have all the momentum in this series. Yeah, they need nothing short of a miracle miracle to hold here, Berkeley. That's gonna be it. You're absolutely right. What a beautiful play. As we noticed earlier as well, Goomba made the swap on the Bethel pilots. Or sorry, Daisy made the swap on the Bethel pilots and realized, hey, this Zenyatta, it's not working. So I'm gonna make the swap to Baptiste, give us an immortality field. And as they begin to push more and more, we're gonna have that amplification matrix in our backline. We'd love to see them try. Beautiful play overall from the pilots to get back into this series. And that's what we can expect in a matchup that's as close as this. Two 2-0 two teams. I know one has a forfeit, but with their similar opponent being SIUE Black, they both get a 3-0 or a 3-1 win. We knew this one was going to be close. I expect teams to win on their map pick, and I expect if they lose their map pick, they lose the entire match. So Cumberland has to make map 3 count. We'll be headed there just after this break.
Hello, howdy, hola, and welcome back. I'm hyped to be here. My name is Chase Nuclear Nukem. Joined to side Berkeley Alt Charge Stevens once again for some Thursday night action packed Overwatch. We are halfway through the series between the Bethel Pilots and the Cumberland Phoenix in the Champion Central Division. Berkeley, things have been tough for the Cumberland Phoenix, but the Pilots came back in that last map. It's now 1 1. It looks like Rialto's been banned and Dorado's been picked. What are your thoughts going into Dorado? Dorado is one of those maps where high ground is everywhere and it is just the best positioning on the map. The high grounds through and through. They're not just like a ledge that's a couple feet above your head. It's just towering buildings where you get these incredible angles from. And I really think that Bethel on the dive is going to stage so well on this map. I'm shocked that the Phoenix picked it because I think the pilots have the edge here. I would have to agree with you, Berkeley. I'm also a bit confused why the Phoenix chose this map. Maybe they're trying to make a statement on their dive composition, or maybe they have a trick up their sleeve that we have not seen yet. As I said earlier, Berkeley, it's a matter of what hands you show and how you're showing them, and the versatility of the heroes at this point in the series is going to make all the difference going into these map picks. So I'm also interested in see what the Cumberland Phoenix has in store. Yeah, I mean, Dorado, one of those maps where you can get like a Cole Cassidy to just kind of poke and prod around natural cover near the payload the entire time and get it to work. Even at high ranks, you can end up getting that to work. But I really feel like high level team play, this map is a dive map. And so far, we've seen Bethel be the dive first team. They picked Blizzard World because they wanted open space like on point two that they held Cumberland on to just relentlessly dive into the back line. So we'll see what Cumberland's strat is going into this. Somehow they're going to have to peel for Hemlock. It looks like they've got Leon Master on the brig, at least in the locker room. That could stabilize things a bit. But with Gil on Farah, I expect someone to play Mercy. And Berkeley, I am just smiling ear to ear because you know this whole time what if we've been wrong what if bethel's strong composition is their dive composition and they didn't want to show their hand early by playing it so they decided on more of a brawl comp and that's why they want to take the phoenix here because they're confident that their dive can beat the phoenix on this map specifically that would be a wild turn of events if cumberland ended up just being the strong dive team uh we'll just have to see right now Bethel has that name because Cumberland, they want to play Brawl first every single time we've gone right. to a different battleground. I mean, this is the very first time where we've seen Cumberland be like, all right, we're going to be on dive right from the jump. Absolutely. And, you know, pseudo dive sort of. Gil is going to make the transition to Widowmaker for the first time in this series. Maybe looking for some heads, going hunting and finding it in the sense of Goomba, that's gonna be a resurrect immediately and finding Peach, Gil will fall to Goomba, but not before the flying all-star healer on the side of the pilots falls. That's a very worthwhile trade too. Goomba is well supported up here in the meantime. Waluigi actually getting the kill on Vakela could stabilize the Bethel Pilots defense for a moment. And it looks like they're going to have no trouble doing it, but it looked like Gil just opened up a huge window there by taking down Peach. Just wasn't quite enough. Cumberland couldn't capitalize. Not at all. I couldn't agree more. I mean, Cumberland... They're kind of just stuck in this series, Berkeley, it feels like. It feels like the pilots have their note at every turn they know exactly what they're expecting and they're just anticipating this dive much better than cumberland is anticipating death bethel's dive gill finding a headshot in the back line on waluigi after an attempted pulse bomb but killa is gonna defense matrix eat that up all day like grandma's thanksgiving dinner and right now we've got a couple of kills for the Phoenix coming through. Gil trying to claim the high ground knocked off. Lulo having to retreat, get some HP back. Minefield comes out. This could be a big one too. Shy Guy put that right under the catwalk, but it claimed no kills. Nano boost going on to kill it, and now the heat seeking missile can come out. Can it take down the Mercy Pocket at Ash though? A new Mercy Pocket is insane, and it looks like Kill is not going to get the value required out of that nano. Yeah, I think we got our answer we were looking for in the last round, Berkeley. This Mercy Pocket on the Bob is in fact working. 
and it is working so well. The pilots are just full holding this defense. Cumberland Phoenix are making some moves, but it's because the pilots want them to move. The pilots are allowing them to move. They let them take a little bit of space so they can throw the bob on the back line and halt this payload where it's at. Now the Phoenix are going to have to overextend if they want to touch. The pilots are going to regroup. The rally is going to get popped. The pulse bomb is going to stick to the immortality field, and a fight is breaking out. Daisy almost going down here. Look at those health bars. Peach actually falls, and then Daisy can't withstand the damage. Great job there by Gil and Killa. Coming through with three quick kills. And now it looks like Cumberland, they were slow to get it, but they have three minutes, 30 seconds back up on the clock. Now as they enter the streets phase. And Chase, I gotta say, it's not what you would think as meta, but Killa seems like a diva player. And I think that's just where yeah. Killa has to stick. I think that's where the comfort is in this dive comp, uh, comp we're seeing from Cumberland. Killa, you know, Diva's able to do a lot of damage. Often not able to quite find the kills though, and that might be why we see Gil on this Widowmaker trying to finish these kills where they're finding them as well as getting that damage off in the back line so killa has a for sure target of where to go goomba also now making the transition over to widowmaker and as the namesake would say sending gil back to the spawn room the pilots are retaliating in a big way i love goomba not afraid to go over to the widowmaker now having to duel tamaki up top battling it out for this high ground oh, oh, oh. nailing the shot there the headshot to boot goomba claiming the high ground that was silly. That was so silly. Goomba just walking around, metal detectors going off, going, wait a second, I sense someone nearby, finding the Star Tracer player in the corner and getting the headshot off. Very cheeky, very fun. Peach getting the resurrect on Waluigi and setting back up into the position. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I need to take a step back. Is that Torbjorn? Oh yeah, they've had Torb ever since they've had the Widowmaker. Silly. Silly! The pilots yeah. are just adapting this comp um, and, and trying really everything out at this point. I honestly think that they're only playing Torb because Waluigi wants to play the closest thing to Waluigi possible. You know, that's a good point. Waluigi was on the Sombra earlier, and I would say that's a big trickster character, whereas Torb is more of a haha, I'm in your face and I'm, I'm doing the funny. Torb has the closest frame to Waluigi too. I think it, there's just a what? lot of comfort in that pick. Ah, uh, maybe maybe to to Wario. I don't know about Waluigi. Waluigi's a little bit stockier, but I, I do agree Soldier that is. Soldier 76 probably has the closest frame. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, I would say I would say probably Soldier 76. Yeah, oh, that, that's what they need too. to do. This this game right now is just calm before the storm in the streets phase. We've got a minute before right. the action really starts to pop off here. Uh, right. right now, it's just the defense keeping the attacking Phoenix at bay. Yeah, the Phoenix are making inch by inch sort of what they were doing in the first point and what Bethel was so successful in in that second point is just taking these meters where they can and where this is where dive comp has its disadvantages. If you're not on that payload, it's moving. It is moving. Now we start to see the odds come out from the Phoenix. The Nano first. That sent the pilots off the high ground now we have the rally coming out killa nearly has the self-destruct as well goomba lands the headshot onto gill the bomb comes out it's got to find something Ooh. it doesn't the immortality field from daisy saves everyone but the remek squishes goomba you could even say goomba stomps goomba and now there's a little bit of an opening for the phoenix here to get something done waluigi and peach are both felled and now we just have around 15 meters left before the phoenix can actually make their way onto point three yeah, Bethel pilots are going to need to regroup and touch if they want here, and it is going to- Oh! Uh, 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 that was awkward. Shy guy looking like they were going to touch, but maybe got a little sheepish, deciding not to slam down and just go back in the back line like any shy guy would do. New guys, we're just kind of watching very slow build up. And it seems like every time we're just almost to overtime and Cumberland have the resources to get the point. Is that a good winning strategy to just chisel your way through a map by any means necessary? Or should they be trying to ball out a little more and add some more time to the clock? I could be wrong, but it honestly, Berkeley, seems like the pilots are getting a little 
too comfortable in their dominance in the series. They're making changes left and right. I guess sort of just trying to feel out what Cumberlake Phoenix is throwing at them. Both Gil and Goomba swapping off the Widowmaker for this third point is a great transition, but the pilots have just made these really bold, cheeky plays all series, whereas the Phoenix have really put the pedal to the metal trying to make it happen. I, I almost wonder if this is going to be an entirely different offense when sides switch. Yeah, I think it could be. I mean, letting the Phoenix kind of chisel their way to the map, to this point of the map, uh, you know, it might look okay because you're going to likely get a stop here if you're Bethel. You've saved your resources for the part of the game that matters the most. But, but if you don't... You've given up a ton of this map at this point. I mean, two and a half points is a lot for Cumberland to be able to hold on defense. Right. And, I mean, they're two fights away from taking it at this point. Bethel Pilots have all of their ultimates in utility, and that is a massive oh. self-destruct. Deadeye gonna get booped into the air, taken off. Leon, Master Tamaki, sending Goomba away, and Waluigi getting a couple of kills on the Torbjorn. The ultimate is going to be huge, as the Molten Core will secure the victory in... Well, not victory, but the defense for the Pilots. Berkeley, you were right. It was kind of just building up, building up, building up, and then they sent everything at once. Yeah, they saved those four ultimates till the end, and honestly, Cumberland, Killa threw in a really good self-destruct, and I still want to see Killa play the D.Va because it seems like that's just naturally who they're good at in a dive comp, where Shy Guy is clearly a ball player. Uh, but the pilots, even though they had all the alt economy in the world, Killa self-destruct almost ended things there for them. It actually propped yeah. up the Deadeye a little bit, but if it didn't do that and the Deadeye didn't get that one kill, that would have been a totally different fight. That Cassidy had maybe 50 HP, Berkeley. That took most of the health bar. They were lucky to be that far away from the self-destruct, just far enough in the parameter where it's going to boop them up, but not close enough where it's going to kill them. I, I don't think it was a positioning move. I think it was more they were trying to drop and pop the Deadeye. They weren't able to drop. They got booped and they got the kill. I just think it hap by happenstance, the pilots were able to hold. But you're absolutely right. The Cumberland Phoenix were edging out the victory. Killa had a great self-destruct at the end of that round. Yeah, they almost got it done with very little resources. But in the end, it was Bethel who had the entire alt economy bank to work with getting a relatively easy hold even though it kind of got shaken up there and now we're going to see Bethel attack with what they're known for the pharmacy wrecking ball dive comp occasionally pocketing Goomba on the ash and Cumberland they've got to find a way to defend this I like having Gil on the Cassidy I like Killa Stang on the Diva. that should be able to deal with Waluigi's Farah rather easily and Waluigi already taking to the floor of the map maybe they switch early I think it would be smart well notice as well Berkeley Leon Master is now on Zenyatta which, that, this is a very anti-pharmacy dive comp Cumberland Phoenix is running. Maybe they were anticipating the pilots to pull out the pharmacy in the first round, and when they didn't, they said, let's just run it with what we have. Leon Master, it, that's just a serotonin boost, hearing those orbs get charged up and hit all at the same time. Uh, but you'd know a thing or two about Zenyatta, right, Berkeley? Yeah, I only drew him for 218 days until the game came out. Uh, <laughs> I still have some nightmares of cartoonist and yada. No, I love the guy. And that was a pretty serendipitous volley that was aimed at, uh, I believe, Shy Guy and just happened to find Daisy under that doorway. I love when those kills kind of just come together. And right now, Phoenix, they're holding this first point exactly as they should. Setting Killa up on this building every single time, staging the fights as they should. But now, it looks like it's going to start to unravel. Goomba is going to hold down the payload, fanning the hammer as much as they can into Killa, trying to demech the D.Va. Now we're going to see this fight spill into some close corridors here. It's the cover girl battle. Waluigi wins it. The tracer duel taken down. Tamaki no longer for this world. Yeah, a, ra a rave in the health pack room as they were just kind of dipping and diving, shooting as much as they could. And it was awkward. It was funny awkward. Daisy was just hanging out outside, healing and throwing resources in for Waluigi. Like, hey, I, I gotcha, I guess. Nano boost going in the back line, though. That's going to be the... Pocketed Gil making it out. Ooh, that's gonna be a dead eye popped. Gil taking out Goomba and finding the sucker punch on Daisy to secure the hold for the Phoenix. 
Love that play right there by Gil Cole Cassidy. Just takes a puff of the cigar and has all the confidence in the world. High noons right inside three people and finds every single kill. I love that play from Gil, playing with confidence until they're shut down. And right there they weren't. Uh, you know I do too, Berkeley. But the Phoenix had to use a lot of resources. The whole economy is drained. We are about to go into a... It's about to be bad for everyone involved. We're about to pull out of a bank account. Bankruptcy is about to happen as the pilots have all five ultimates online. And really all they need to do is ram into this point, use a couple of resources and call it a push. Yeah, these are certainly some lopsided resources we're looking at. Goomba doesn't even need any resources there to get that kill on to Leon Master. And now Bethel can work their way in slowly using the alts as they need it. The Valk, the Immortality Field and the Ant Matrix all coming out now. And then Goomba, just to silence Killa, is able to Deadeye right at the end. They still have the Pulse Bomb here if things get a little dicey, as the payload isn't as close to the objective as they might like. Yeah, I think they'll still take it in time, though, as everyone regroups around the payload. They might see a touch from the Cumberland Phoenix. Nah, that's gonna be it. Three minutes now on the clock in this push. The Bethel Pilots have positioned themselves well. They have their wing condition, as we said a little bit ago, Ber Berkeley, but it's taken them a bit longer. They're not quite going 70 miles an hour like the Phoenix were back and forth. Pilots are taking a little bit more time to get there. Yeah, and this is the hardest part of Dorado to get through when you're playing up against a dive comp, but right now, Bethel knows that Cumberland, they didn't spawn in the most opportune location. They spawned split, and they took total advantage of those advanced spawns Gil finds that kill onto Waluigi, who got a little too aggressive there near the Mega, but still it looks like the Bethel Pilots offense is going to be cooking for a little bit. Yeah, you're right. That split spawn advantage has put the Pilots in a peculiar situation where they have one to two people pushing on point, and they're going to get pretty far. They're pretty close to second point now, making up for lost time. I like how they're ignoring that slept shy guy wrecking ball there. And Gil just takes to the high ground. That's where the fight is going to need to take place. Ooh. Dicing up Peach as well. Each Cole cast he's able to take down a support, but Gil loses the duel there to Goomba. Goomba popping the dead eye. Takes down the baby diva. <laughs> Tamaki in the meantime is able to stick one on the Goomba. And right now, trades are going wild. Resources are building. And we've got about 15 meters until the second checkpoint is reached. Oh, and this is going to be a huge dagger if they're able to pull it off. Both supports of the Cumberland Phoenix regrouping. That was very close as Shy Guy almost got a really quick stagger on Leon Master. Cumberland set up so well here though. I mean, even though they're all on the low ground, Killa can just take to the high ground anytime they need to to shut down a Bethel Pilot damage dealer. Shy Guy popping the minefield here, trying to zone the Phoenix back inside third point. This is gonna be enough though. Tamaki breaks through the minefield, Ooh. taking down Goomba. Waluigi falls to the a uh, biotic name from Hemlock, and the support's really coming alive right now for Cumberland. They take down two, and the defense is going to hold. I think Cumberland's supports realized at the end of the last push, Berkeley, that they were going to need to have the synergy in order to keep the pilots off of them. Because Shy Guy has been on Leon Master pretty much the whole series. Goomba, anytime Hemlock or Leon Master have shown their heads, have gone for those headshots. So. The ability to peel on both of these heroes, you know, Zen has a great melee kicking you back. Hemlock has the biotic nade. It's great peel for each other if they have those resources up and they're near each other in proximity to do so. Yeah, these Cumberland Phoenix supports are just playing in sync with each other. This is some unreal coordination way in the back line to keep each other safe. And they just have to do it for one more fight. And the Phoenix pull off a fantastic hold here on defense. And Chase, this is what we talked about last round. Bethel kind of let yep. Cumberland chisel their way to third point before ending the game. And I don't think they took enough chances on defense to end it earlier. Cumberland is about to come out on top. It is a bold choice, though. Goomba's going to swap over the Widowmaker for this last initial push, getting it in. And that's a great, this is a great place to play Widowmaker. It's a very open round. It's going to be a matter of who's hitting the shots. That's going to be Daisy finding Gil Tamaki, getting a response on Shy Guy. No immortality field on the side of the pilots in order to keep them alive. And this Widowmaker is positioned very well to hunt these heads in the back line. Will they be able to hold? Well, Leon Master does pop the Transcendence, not before Killa is de-suited out of the mech. 
Goomba taking the sight line makes it so- Oh, oh my god, we've got a C9. Cut everything right there. Cumberland, what? take Dorado. Oh, uh, what? <laughs> okay. <Wow. laughs> I wasn't ready for that, Berkeley, but uh, you know, welcome to Overwatch. You're never ready for a C9. It's the beauty of a C9. Yeah. Cumberland calls C9 and sink Bethel's battleship. That was a rough one. I haven't seen one that bad in a minute. Yeah, I, like I your, think... I like your expression right there. Just a big yikes. Yeah, set the <laughs> load size to oof, Berkeley. That's unfortunate. And it's one of those things where I don't think it was intentional by any... Not that a C9's ever intentional, but they were all in proximity of the point. I think they just narrowly just swept off point and it was just enough for that ticker to go straight to zero and Cumberland Phoenix to take it now to one they're on game point Berkeley and I don't think the pilots were expecting that because they really got the momentum in our second map going into the third map they had all the momentum to lose yeah, I mean, this one does kind of come down to one of those games where it's so close on paper where if you lose your map pick, I mean, at this point, if you lose your map pick, you lose the series, right? That's the guarantee. Uh, we're going to have Bethel pick the next map. If they lose, they lose the series. If they win, Cumberland get the next map pick. And if they lose, they lose the series. So you have to deliver when the ball is in your court. And even though it was a cheeky little C9, Cumberland still delivered. That was on second point. They made it to third anyway. They had a win condition in front of them, even if they gave that up. Cumberland played some fantastic overwatch there to keep the pilots off the scoreboard. Even when they were on offense, Berkeley, they did a great job of just chipping away and keeping someone on point. That's the big thing with dive. It's so easy to forget or coordinate who's pushing the payload when you have a tracer or wrecking ball, a Genji, and the whole kitchen sink in the back line, right? You got to ensure someone is there pushing and has their foot on the gas. And I think that's where Cumberland just has a little bit more coordination, whereas Bethel pilots, they just are more comfortable, it seems, in their dive composition as a whole in what's meta yeah and speaking about what's meta we're going to head to a push map which doesn't happen too much early on in the season but that is where we're going to go and at this point cumberland is the only team of these two that has played a push map in competition in the necc this spring that's true because they did go 3-1 in their prior series and so they had to play push that's an interesting point and honestly berkeley now that i'm thinking about it push favors more of that brawl composition in my opinion if you're able to play around the push especially if you have a may you can position that right next to the payload as it or the robot i guess as it's pushing and um that shuts off an entire team's entry point so the cumberland phoenix i think are positioned really well to take this final map and it looks like we have the maps in yeah new queen street got banned i do like that ban i think that's probably the brawliest uh push map that exists but we're going to be headed to coliseo so fairly linear dive comp is a little tough to work in the middle stage of that map but it kind of starts to shine toward the end so we'll see i think cumberland might have a little bit of an edge here but i don't think anyone would be shocked if the pilots won and we head to map five. Oh, i wouldn't be shocked I, they've come through in the series once again as we're getting further into the series berkeley i mentioned this in the legends division map but it comes down to momentum endurance and mentality this endurance on both of these teams is going to determine whether or not they take the w we're going into map very shortly though and we'll see the streets of coliseo firsthand and hopefully see what these teams are going to pick. Well, we got about 20 seconds before that happens, but I'm I'm interested. I am invested. I'm here for it. Is Killa going to go back on the Diva, or are they going to run that more traditional brawl composition? Oh, there's so many options here, but yeah, dude, one of the things you said when I asked you, what are these teams' biggest challenges today? One of your answers was mentality, and yeah. coming off of a C9 like Bethel just did, mentality is the biggest challenge you have to overcome because you just let Dorado yeah. slip out of your hands for free. That game could have gone on longer, and it didn't. How do you respond here on Coliseo? Ramatra, apparently. And I think the I, Bethel I pilots... Think I, I actually like this composition. Ramatra, honestly, falling a bit out of the meta since the nerfs. Um, at the higher level of Overwatch, he's a little bit easier to deal with now, but I still think he's a bit of a menace towards the lower tiers. The Bethel Pilots are going to go with a fantastic Brawl composition, though, in this May 
uh, Ramatra play where the Cumberland Phoenix are going to have a very similar comp. Support's going to be a little bit different, but they're going to have that Reinhardt on lock with both May and Cole Cassidy as DPS on either side. I personally would say in terms of composition though, Berkeley, the Cumberland Phoenix has the better comp going into this game. I think Ryan is a great counter to Ramatra in his current state, and as long as they're able to keep the advantage and really keep the pressure on the pilots, the pilots are going to be stuck on their back foot. Yeah, I agree. I love Ryan Ramatra matchups because Ramatra has a chance to take down Ryan when they nemesis form properly and can deal damage through the Ryan shield. But if Killa knows how to time out that nemesis form from Shy Guy and just go in and try and pummel like he's currently doing, pummel out the nemesis form, and then when it goes down, Shy Guy has no chance at living. Daisy's doing a fantastic job here with the pocket, but it's still not enough. Killa just never stopped swinging right there. Yeah, Daisy nearly kept Shy Guy alive. I was surprised. I thought Daisy was going to pull it through, but uh, it was just a bit too much damage to deal with especially with peach being gone leon master taken out daisy with a punch and following up with a kill on goomba didn't know we had a third dps in the house berkeley now never doubt leon master there from the back line the baptiste can lace the lead and that's what we're that's what we're seeing a little bit of poisoning that lead being a bit too much for the pilots to handle as i say that they're gonna get two picks but almost immediately the cumberland phoenix are getting this forward spawn they have just a couple more inches to do it and berkeley you gave me a crazy statistic last week like in the overwatch league i think you said it was 80 percent of the people who make the forward spawn win the map yeah, 80% of the teams who get the advanced spawn first win the push map. And right now it looks like Bethel are able to defend it here, but their back is up against the wall. Cumberland got awfully close, so Bethel has to come up with a big push in response. This very, this very push. Yeah, and they have the resources to do it, Berkeley. They've been in worse positions in this series and still made their way through. They have a perfect alt combo with the nano boost into... Uh, the Ramatra Ultimate Annihilation, that's going to be huge if they play it right. Cumberland Phoenix can defend with a Deadeye, albeit it will be very difficult to do so. Cumberland can also just speed boost away from it. Bethel doesn't have True. a Lucio, so if Hemlock saves the speed, that's actually the best tool to deal with an Annihilation. You just hightail it out of that fight, and you can negate two big Bethel Ultimates. I love that Overwatch's way of nerfing the ult of Ramatra was to just run away from it. <laughs> don't don't go yeah. near it, and you're fine. <laughs> that time, though, they do go near it, and they pay for it. They are suffering as Ramatra has. As he won't let us forget in any given point in time. The pilots will continue their push, and you'll notice Goomba is now on the Soldier, and that railgun will be online. Overclock is ready to go. Cumberland Phoenix regrouping again, and they don't have the alt economy in their favor this time. They'll need to dry fight up to a point or look for a good pick. Somehow avoiding the damage that Goomba's gonna take out. Gil actually silences Goomba right there with a sticker grenade, and that's what the Phoenix Whoa. needed. Taking down Peach in the back line as well. Look at Gil get active on this flank. Does pay for it, but makes a ton of space for the Phoenix to push up. Shy Guy's going to get caught out here, and now Killa can stand strong in the front line. Trading your Cole Cassidy for two kills in the back line and leaving your tank with near 180, 200 health is a win in the book of the Cumberland Phoenix. All they needed to do was stagger the pilots to a point that, like you said earlier, Berkeley, they don't have a very mobile team aside from the Sojourn and the Mercy. So if they're able to take this advantage and push this robot as far as they can, they're so close to that forward spawn that they desperately need to really secure this map. And right now the Phoenix just kind of backed off the bot for a moment. They collected their members coming out of spawn. Goomba still has the overclocked and hasn't used it. So we have to see if Goomba makes a big impact. It is let loose here up on the high ground. Perched pretty well, but nothing's gotten taken down yet. Everything's frozen up. Tamaki can't live through it. Frozen still an easy railgun for Goomba to land. And the pilots are looking like they're going to be pushing yet again. Nuke, this one could just be going back and forth, back and forth. It might be a while before the advanced spawns are unlocked because these teams are just choosing to save their resources for when they have to defend. 
they are. And I don't know if I agree with the Blizzard and the Overclock used at the exact same time. I guess their thought process was that they're going to have Annihilation up soon and they could expend both ultimates. But you're absolutely right, Berkeley. At this point in push, before you take the forward spawn, you're ping-ponging back and forth. And the first team that staggers is the team that loses. The first team that staggers is the team that loses. Right now we've got Gil once again trying to get active in the back line. Not enough though to take down Shaga, who's able to live through Peach with the Valk right now doing all in their power to keep the tank alive in the Annihilation. And the Annihilation, even though stunned to the floor, is there to take down Tamaki. Still wow. standing strong as Shaga moving forward effortlessly. And the bot continues to push for the pilots. I think Killa saw the opening and decided to take it with the charge, trying to take out Shy Guy before the Annihilation was enough to kill the rest of the Cumberland Phoenix, but unfortunately falling as soon as they dive in. Killa is realizing maybe this Reinhardt isn't working, makes the swap over to this Ramatra themselves, and Leon Master will not be on the Kiriko. And the pilots just unlocked the advanced spawns and they used those ultimates on the offense. That was the first time a team has done that here in this push map. And Goomba actually opens up with an elimination there onto Gil. So right now we've got a five versus four advantage. Cumberland Phoenix have to backpedal here. Kill is back over to the Ramatra for the first time this game. But Goomba with blood in the water slides forward, takes down Tamaki, and they're looking to find more. Kill is at an off angle, maybe a little bit too much of an off angle. They could get caught out here as Waluigi has a blizzard and a wall in just one second the pilots have just done a better job this entire map berkeley of dry fighting we're seeing both of the damaged dps ults back online with less than a fight later massive sleep coming out as well that dart will find its target in the back line of the cumberland phoenix the kitsune rush gonna cross section the battlefield in an attempt for the phoenix to defend but they have very little people available to do so and it looks like the pilots could be sending us to a map five. They're just meters away from completing Colosseo, and it looks like they've got it in the bag. Annihilation is the end game ultimate you crave in Overwatch 2. And right wow. here, it should be enough to take down the remaining Phoenix. Yeah, Shy Guy will find its mark. Gil will get a sticky kill on Goomba, but as you said, Berkeley, that's not going to be enough. And they're going to take it with two minutes and 39 seconds left on the clock. Bethel Esports claps back in a big way. Momentum on their side. And oh, yep, uh, Berkeley, I'll be right back. I got to let in the janitor because I think this is going to go. Well, I guess it's not a reverse sweep. Never mind. But he's still back <laughs> to clean up the mess that the Cumberland Phoenix has left for us going into this game five. Get him in here. The janitor loves Overwatch anyway. It doesn't matter if it's going to be a reverse sweep or a sweep, but yeah, the pilots, they win their map pick. They send us to map five. Cumberland are going to control the battleground. They're going to pick the stage for map five, but we're going to be headed there in just a couple minutes. Stick around. Map five on deck.
Welcome back once again, folks, for this absolute barn burner of a series. It's Game 5, the Bethel Pilots taking on Cumberland Phoenix in this Champion Central Division match. Once again, I'm Chase Nuclear Nukem, joined by Berkeley Alt Charge Stevens. Berkeley, it's the second week in a row that we've had a Game 5, and I feel like the competitive integrity every season in the NECC is just upped a little bit more. The Pilots in the Phoenix, who is going to reign the victor in the skies this week? Yeah, and these two teams, Chase, are so familiar with each other. I mean, they battle it out in playoffs like every single semester, and it's never a sweep. It's always close between these two teams, and of course we're going to five in this game. Uh, it looks like Oasis is going to be the battleground that Cumberland picked for our final map of the night. And Nuke, I don't know. I don't want to say that anyone has an edge because we've been surprised so far, but the one thing that's been consistent is if you pick the map, you win the map. That has been consistent. However, I'm a bit, uh, I guess, surprised, Berkeley, that they banned Ilios. We've seen the Phoenix perform more of this brawl comp on control, specifically around the Symmetra, and I feel like Symmetra has a little bit more value on Ilios. Oasis is still a great map, but I feel like it's a little bit more open. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a couple of different maps you could have gone with here. I think Control is probably the most limited game mode other than Push, so you don't have the most choices in terms of, like, diversity where you're going to play different comps on different maps, but the only thing that I'm really remembering from our first Control on Lijiang Tower is, one, Cumberland wanted to play Brawl a lot, and two, they won the first Control. So I guess if I have to give an edge to someone, it is going to be the Phoenix, but really, I think this one goes all three points. I think it's neck and neck, and Bethel has as good a chance as Cumberland to take this one away. I think so, too. In fact, I think Bethel has maybe a little bit of the edge. As Shy Guy is going to come out immediately on this Ramatra, and it is going to be a brawl fest between these teams. On push, you kind of have an ebb and flow, but on control, you have to fight on point if you want to take point. So we're going to see punches fly and hammers swing as both of these teams fight for control first. Yeah, and I do love how Shy Guy is sticking to the Ramatra. It seems like that is the answer that Bethel was looking for to take down Cumberland's strong brawl composition. They answered it with the dive, but that doesn't always work based on map geometry. Ramatra is the answer they were looking for. Both tanks get traded out here, so it's up to the Squishies to become the playmakers and the space takers. And it's been Gil this entire series. He's been all reliable. Finding a sticky onto Peach in the back line will all but secure the point for the Cumberland Phoenix and Gil taking three of those kills. My goodness, that was max range. It had to be max range for the sticky because Peach was up in the heavens right there, but you can't get away from the homing grenade. Not at all, and man. Gil already 80% to that dead eye. These alts are ramping up fast. That's what I love about these brawl comps. You're dealing so much damage so fast. You're just getting ultimates left and right. It looks like the Maywall's gonna miss its mark a tad. Tamaki not quite looking for the angle. Oh, we're gonna hear an overclock in the back line and that's Gil finding the first pick. Goomba looking to retaliate in a big way as three of their members fall and point is almost lost. Goomba nearly taking point for the pilots but needing to back up. That's going to be a huge stagger as the Phoenix now have 67% on the board. And Goomba's overclocked was the only ultimate used in that last fight. Cumberland didn't spend anything there. They have all six ultimates to close out just 25 seconds left of point one. They have six? Where'd they get the extra? They have six, Nuke. Trust me. Just trust okay. me. All right? I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> First one's the Blizzard. Immortality Field counts as a second, just so I can save my bacon. Okay, and uh, they're okay, still okay. holding on to four from there. Goomba gets Nanote, steps right up into the front line. Can't find any kills immediately, and now the Maywall shuts the door. Five seconds left for Bethel to get a foot onto this objective as overtime starts to expire. Annihilation comes out from Shy Guy as he barrels into the back line, but Killa, who's ignored up front, takes to the skies, or takes, I guess, to the back line himself, and that's gonna oh. close it out. Nuke, right there, it was just a matter of resources, and Cumberland had all of them. Yeah, Cumberland did have all of them, but I, that was a pseudo C9 again, Berkeley. The pilots not necessarily wanting to miss that touch. They had the May ultimate while Luigi was coming in on point, bringing the frost of the north with them. 
the blizzard was popped unfortunately just a tad too slow to the draw not making it in time the phoenix are gonna go up in this point or in the up a point in this map and the pilots now need two in the bank to take this victory and it was nice to see Cumberland having no problems at all to answer the Ramatra that was troubling them so much on Coliseo. And now that has Bethel scratching their heads, they go back to the Wrecking Ball dive comp that's been effective here and there for them, but right now the pressure is on getting sweeped on point one. That is not what I was expecting. Me neither. And it came down, like you said earlier, to resource management and how they were utilizing what they had. I feel like they did a much better job on this dive composition but on Oasis, is that going to make the difference? You're kind of forcing it on this point of Oasis. The next point would really be the, the place to bring out a dive composition. That's going to be Gil finding the first pick on Waluigi to break open this first point. Yeah, Gil, the wing cutter, takes Peach and Waluigi, both birds out of the sky with the Peacekeeper. And now, once again, Cumberland, they waste no time pushing the gas pedal to the floor. Take it to the spawn. Bethel backed all the way up. But Bethel does have the alt economy on their side, I'd say, Berkeley. Sure, Leon Master have ampli has Amplification Matrix, but Overclock's almost up on Goomba. They have Shy Guy almost has the the uh, Minefield, sorry, drawing a blank there. They almost have the Minefield as well, and that could be a huge value as they are going to pop this Amplification Matrix up top and look for these kills. Overclock's gonna get popped, make quick work of that May wall as Bethel pilots are squeezing into point. And the sound barrier from Hemlock is going to help the Phoenix live through the overclock from Goomba, but now Shy Guy disperses mines everywhere on the objective and now Cumberland have to step carefully. Slammed into the back line is Shy Guy. He doesn't find any E limbs there, but he gets the immortality field out of Leon Master. Barrage with some cover and it finds Killa before getting taken down by Tamaki. Did Waluigi do enough taking down the pillar of this Cumberland Phoenix team? It looks like it is enough. It looks like it is gonna be enough. However, Gil putting up a great fight, looking for Peach's head immediately. That's gonna be uh, uh, the nice percent for Cumberland Phoenixes. It's gonna get swapped over to the Bethel Pilots. Berkeley playing uh, a, a pharmacy right now is a very bold move when they have a May and a Cole Cassidy on the side of the Cumberland Phoenix. I'm surprised it's worked this long for the Pilots. Yeah, your Zenyatta is obviously going to be very vulnerable. Goomba can keep his space pretty well, but Daisy, if they get closed onto, they're pretty much done. You're looking to hit Rex right on top of Shy Guy's slams. And if they can do that, that's a ton of burst damage. But Gil, Gil's been taking people out of the sky left and right. That time gets Peach, and I think the pilots without the Mercy Pocket just kind of fall apart here. Waluigi makes me eat my words as he takes down Leon Master, but short-lived as Gil is able to get the kill onto Waluigi as well. Gil is just securing these final shots for the Phoenix. As I say that, getting taken out by Goomba. Caster's Curse taking full effect, but Berkeley, they're now at 76%. Bethel Pilots are retouching virtually because they have to now, and it's an opportune position for them to do so. They now taken out three on the side of the Phoenix. They're in a good way. The Phoenix are at 88%, right around 90%. They got a solid, you know, 20 to 30% out of that push. The pilots are gonna have to hold from here on out, or this is gonna be a Cumberland Phoenix match 3-2. Yeah, the Phoenix got this one into final fight territory. They have an Earth Shatter, an Ant Matrix coming up on their damage dealing ultimates as well. Bethel have some good resources to defend this with, but they don't have support ultimates. So somehow they have to find ways to live if the Phoenix can land their heavy hitters. And right now we're going to see Killa under some pressure here. As Shy Guy says, you're not getting up here. Puts the entire minefield up right on that staircase. And now working from the bottom, Killa's in some wow. trouble, gets barraged down again. The last time they're barraged down the main table, Tank. That was a wrap on the fight, and it looks like Phoenix is headed for the hills once more. Waluigi really made, making me eat my words as well, finding a great position. If you are running this pharmacy, you don't want to be out in the open just for Gil to do aim trainer on you for. You want to be directly above them. And Waluigi finding that angle, kind of shimmying along the side of these uh, of the natural cover on this point getting in and getting the barrage off. That's now gonna be the pilots defending as the Cumberland Phoenix looks for the final push to take away the series. I did not think they were getting the touch right there. It looked like the 
boop. I think it was Shy Guy who got the boop was going to be enough, but still. It looks like Phoenix wow. just had to panic their way onto that point. They were so disjointed, and the pilots dissected that last attack. We're headed to a point three of map five. Nuke, only one of these teams can remain undefeated, and they are fighting tooth and nail to make it theirs. Absolutely, and I think had the Phoenix, you know, position themselves a bit better to get into that point, which it was just unfortunate, right? You, you can't do much against the wrecking ball diving on your back line and sending you all up into the air, but they had the Earth Shatter online. Had Killa been able to get that Shatter off, it could have been a very different point for the Cumberland Phoenix. Now 1-1, one, one, Berkeley, you're absolutely right. And I actually think the Bethel Pilots have the advantage on this point. This is a very dive composition oriented point. And now the Cumberland Phoenix are sort of forced to take it to the Pilots territory. It's their airspace, exactly... as you could say. Yeah. Honestly, uh, Killa on the D.Va could give Waluigi some troubles here, but what I was going to say is Li Zhang Tower went the same way as this one. Cumberland 1.1, Bethel 1.2, Cumberland 1.3. They made the proper adjustments here, though. It looks like a dogfight is underway. Gil wins. It takes down Waluigi, but Peach is still alive. Could get the res. No, Tamaki closes in and with the melee removes the mercy. Hemlock is able to res back up Leon Master, and I think from here on out, it should be easy pickings for the Phoenix. And that's some smooth as butter synergy from the DPS backline on the Phoenix. They will, oh, it looks like we are going to see a slight touch from Shy Guy. It is going to give the rest of the pilots enough time to make their way back to point, but Shy Guy opting to get off. Um, Cumberland Phoenix will take that point as Gil is sent back to the respawn room, and they don't have their beloved pharmacy to hold this defense. Shy Guy knows that the railgun was hit on the hemlock and then just slammed directly onto the Mercy. Great work there, diving, coordinating with the Sojourn to end up confirming that kill. And now it should be Bethel collecting themselves very well. They should get the point back here, but it's going to be not the easiest take in the world as Tamaki and Gil start to come alive. Daisy was rezzed back up by Peach, but this one's not over yet. The Phoenix still hold it, 30% and climbing, and they're close to a barrage, close to support ultimates as well. If they hold this one any longer, the Phoenix could clutch, but Cumberland start to fall one by one. Kill is back in the fray, but it looks like they might be kept at bay. The backside of the point is the only place Cumberland can touch. You said the word of the day there, Berkeley, and that has got to be coordination, which we're seeing seamless coordination from the Bethel pilots in this point. Cumberland Phoenix is making great individual plays, but the pilots just know how to coordinate these dive comps and getting in, getting out, getting the targets where they need them to be. And the alt economy is just looking in their favor now. Gil will have the barrage and Killa will have the self-destruct online as well as I guess they will also have Valkyrie. But on the side of the pilots, they also have their Valkyrie. They have their transcendence and they have their minefield, which we're going to hear popped to kick off this fight. And Gil with the barrage takes down both damage dealers for Bethel. Hemlock reses Gil back up, Peach reses up Waluigi, so the birds are back in the battle. Daisy pops the Transcendence here, carting around to the coast side of the objective. A little bit of help there from Shy Guy to keep Daisy out of the battle for a little bit of time. But in the meantime, on the objective, Gil and Killa continuing to terrorize the pilots, and the Phoenix get the objective back. Pilots taking 43% off that push, but the Cumberland Phoenix, like you said, taking the objective once more. I think Gil starting off that fight with a double kill on the barrage really set the scene for that fight. The Bethel Pilots at the end of the fight only had Daisy and Shy Guy. Tra with Transcendence being popped, it was a matter of time before the Phoenix retook. Now with three ultimates online, the Phoenix are actually in a better position to take this point as we hear the self-destruct in the back line not find any bodies. Nothing there. Waluigi tried to copy Gil and was taken out of the copy form, but Goomba was able to finish the kill on to Gil, and now we're starting to see the Phoenix scramble a little bit toward the back of the objective. They have to pop the Transcendence to stay alive for a moment. Gil still up in the skies trying to terrorize. Waluigi is taken down by Leon Master. Hemlock, the Mercy Pocket that Phoenix relies so heavily on, is removed as well. 97%. Can the Phoenix hold on, closing out map 5, and remain undefeated? Would that kill on to Shy Guy? It certainly looks possible. Closing it on Peach now. The Mercy taken down as well. Tamaki trying to do it himself all the way in the back line. The overtime wick ticks down, and the Phoenix have done it. 
Wow, Berkeley, the Cumberland Phoenix pulling it together and ending out this series in such a poetic way, beating the Bethel Pilots on the dive composition that they've ran this whole series and kept the Phoenix grounded with. However, the play of the game will go to Goomba on the side of the Bethel Pilots. And that control map was almost identical to Li Zheng Tower, where Cumberland won round one, Bethel came out with the dive on round two and one, and then Cumberland go to the dive on round three, and they able, they're able to close out the map. I mean, that was honestly a carbon copy of Li Zheng Tower, except it was on Oasis. Yeah, it was. Back and forth, tip for tat. This was a crazy series, Berkeley. And I, I mentioned the janitor earlier in the sense of sweeps. There was no sweeps that happened here tonight whatsoever. No. Both teams were back and forth every round. It was like watching a WWE ladder match as they were climbing both sides of the ladder, berating each other down as much as they could to try to take the briefcase. The Cumberland Phoenix will win this victory today, but it is inevitable that we see these teams in playoffs, Berkeley. Yeah, this is a regular matchup in the champion central division. I am going to say that without a doubt, these teams will face again. I think they play one more time, maybe in the regular season as well, but definitely this is going to be a matchup that will likely take place in the postseason. These are two of the top teams in champs and Cumberland Phoenix. I think they're one of two teams left in champ central that are going to be undefeated after this week. Wow. And what an accomplishment to have making it and, and sticking it down, putting your flag, planting it, saying this is our W. We're taking it. Love what they're doing over at Bethel. Love what they're doing over at Cumberland and props to both of those teams. It's like I say, every time we see a close series like this, Berkeley, of course, they're going to see each other in play. They've played in NECC for well over two years now, but they've got a good scrim partner in the other team yeah whenever you have a game go five maps in competition partner up that is how you improve drastically throughout the season i hope they do it but chase it's that time of the match where who is your player of the game Oh man, Berkeley, I it's a tough one. It's between Gil and Killa for me. Killa just had the versatility and the tank swaps, needing to pick the Devo and swapping back to the Reinhardt when needed, but Gil securing all of the kills when necessary and making big plays in the back line for the Cumberland Phoenix. I'm torn. What are your thoughts? Both good picks. I gotta go with Killa, so I'm glad that you said that name. If I had to pick somebody from Bethel, I might have gone with Goomba or Waluigi, one of the damage dealers. Shy Guy did great on Wrecking Ball, but I think Killa playing D.Va at this high of a level is something no one expects to see. I think if you're diving, you're diving with Wrecking Ball, maybe a Winston, not a D.Va. Killa performing that well on a hero that's considered niche just puts them as the player of the game in my mind. I would have to agree with you. I think I think it'll edge towards Killa for the versatility. Gil had the aim trainer on lock and definitely was hitting the shots, but that's what you're expecting your DPS to do, right? Killa just was versatile in every turn of the corner. So I would agree with you. Yes, it's going to go to Killa on the side of the Cumberland Phoenix. Well, you got to stay tuned for the next one. Nuke and I are going to be done, but University of Oregon and Fisher is going to be your Legends Division match up next. It's been fun casting. You can follow us on Twitter if you want to keep up with us at our little links down here. And as always, a great job to Bryce and Hippie who are on production tonight. That's all for the two of us. We'll see you next Thursday, but enjoy the next Legends Division game coming up in just a bit.
Hello, Collegiate Esports fans. It's game number three for the NECC, week number three as well. I'm at a class here with LaFon for the last game of the day on this stream. It's Legends West that we're going, and LaFon, it's a matchup. It is, and uh, I mean, this is this is the Legends Division, one of, one of the more high, uh, competitive uh, divisions that we've got in the NECC in terms of the expectations of these teams, right? We really do expect these teams to perform, put on a performance that is uh, hotly contested, and as a result, uh, I think mirroring a lot what we see towards, you know, Tier 2 and above in terms of uh, compositions and play. So that's going to be, I think, an interesting look as we head into the action for this final game of the day for this lovely Thursday. And Men of Class, I mean, uh, teams that we are quite familiar with. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, Fisher College coming in here. A little bit of an up-and-comer of the last uh, collegiate season already. I wouldn't say they came out of nowhere. Obviously, we did see them coming, uh, coming from a mile away. But uh, definitely a fresh addition to the scene. Nep, Avani, Kabe, Abs, and Forgotten. Uh, many of these also not unfamiliar names outside of the collegiate scene. So always good to see them get a double home, not just uh, thinking about their esports future, but their esports future as a whole. Yeah, and I mean, for Cabe specifically, I think this is a, a player that uh, uh, on the DPS, right? Expectations are quite high uh, for him. Um, realistically, you, you kind of uh, kind of play around a lot of the uh, uh, the DPS play that he he brings to the table. So that's something to highlight for for Fisher specifically as we move on to the team that they're playing against. Though the University of Oregon stepping to the forefront. This is perhaps not as uh, at least in the in the in the scheme of collegiate itself, um, not as familiar names uh, across the board. No, definitely not. But as we've seen in the past, collegiate scene is a versatile place and can definitely come up with some surprises here and there. So definitely uh, just because we don't know names all the time or they're not as familiar doesn't mean we can't get familiar with them. And that they can't show us something surprising and maybe cause a little bit of a uh, dent in the record of Fisher. Fisher currently already uh, down one game, but they had to play it against Northwood, who are yeah. obviously one of those law rosters that we're expecting to go very far into the bracket, if not take it all the way. And uh, therefore not a surprise that Fisher got that loss. Yeah, that's the one uh, thing to kind of notice with the with yeah. the record, right? Uh, yeah. University of Oregon being at that two and zero, it's because I mean, it, 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 you know, not to take credit away from them, but uh, yeah. you have to highlight the fact that Fisher did play Northwood, and Northwood is exactly. one of the upper echelon teams just in general. With, you know, I mean, expectations for Northwood is to be you know challenging for that number one position overall. So um, the fact that uh, Fisher lost them doesn't speak a whole lot coming into this game now. I think the pressure still lies on uh, on the University of Oregon. I mean, they are the ones that need to set the sort of the the mark of this game because again look at that one-on-one -on -one record it's easy to kind of dismiss Fisher but again as we said it's a team that uh, has been in big moments before they've won championship tournaments before we know that they're capable of playing under pressure so um, the same cannot be said for the University of Oregon and we need as a result to kind of see them come out of the gate swinging early and of course because it is the NECC because we're in the regular season we're gonna have a first of three series starting with control uh, afterwards going to move over to some other map types of course but first of all that's where we're going to go off to and uh first map of the night i'd say let's get it started as we go to Li Zhang tower where else would, could we start on a night of overwatch lafon it's always Li Zhang tower isn't it yeah, one of the few reasons we don't spend a ton of time talking about the first map uh, anymore is because it's somewhat predictable, right? It is going to be Lijiang Tower the majority of the time. In fact, it's more of a surprise when it's not. Um, and uh, as a result, I, I think expectations have already been met. We know how these teams are going to play here, right? Um, in, in terms of Control Center, which is where we're hovering on for our first round, it's likely going to be Brawl or some form of close quarters combat um, with a lot of high damage throughput. There's a lot of close areas, um, not a lot of avenues to rotate very quickly, so you tend to have a lot of uh, sustain and burst to, to you know sort of mitigate against those two sides of the offense and defense. With that being said, you see the University of Oregon esports green on your right-hand side of the screen. Fisher takes the left in blue. And uh, I think the one thing to kind of highlight is if Putter is going to stay on the Symmetra, Teleporter, a lot of damage, and of course the uh, turrets to slow things down. Meanwhile, Cave going to option off with the wall, blocking out the Reinhardt. Uh, double Reinhardt coming out. Good wall instantly to block off Pyukumuku. With that Reinhardt gets taken out, both Reinhardt's falling eventually, but it's definitely Fisher that takes the uh, lead in this fight. Taking out a full five members, flatline spawns a little bit too quickly for the gong to ring. 
That's a very convincing fight win right there for Fisher. I mean, Forgotten, we saw uh, firsthand why Forgotten is one of the more premier DPS uh, players in Collegiate, you know. Uh, Cabe not gonna get as much of a chance to shine on this particular set section with because of the mage, not nearly as uh, explosive, but the Cassidy's already out of things, so it's gonna be a 4v5 as Fisher re-enter the fight. Definitely a time for Cabe to show up, but uh, immediately gets the headshot onto Potter as Avani shows off that the Tokyo Drift Reinhardt is also going to be a Shanghai Drift Reinhardt coming up here with the Young Tower pick. And chase a couple bit from spawn. But yeah, I mean, that's a convincing fight win. What else can we say about it? Uh, unfortunately, I think UO Esports Green over overestimated the space they had to work with, right? They did get that pick up onto Forgotten, but by the time they were into the actual fight itself, uh, the rest of Fisher were there. And now, I mean, we're into the ultimate portion of the game, and I would expect to see Neb use the window, and there it is. Yeah, Fire Strike right through it. That was an early wall use, so there was a little bit of an opportunity to potentially go in, but they say, you know what, we don't need a wall, we have an application matrix, so we have a lot of damage to follow up in it too. And you know what the surprising part is? It's like the fourth fight already. We're still only on 50% Lafon. There's so much of this map still to be played. Oh, now here comes the shenanigans from Fisher College. Blizzard out of oh, spawn. No. Back into spawn you go. To the Lucio and the Reinhardt up on the high ground. Oh, Lucio actually getting back into spawn. Reinhardt not so uh, gonna be so lucky. UO Esports Green. They're looking for an opening. They're looking for something to work with. That pick on Forgotten looked like one earlier on. That are gonna use the wall here on the high ground, but it was just the May that went there. Not the entire team committing instantly. Now they finally do. It's just gonna be a May in a block stalling for the rest of the team to follow up on any shenanigans happening up on that high ground. And we never really see fights taking place here because why would you ever fight just outside the enemy spawn door? But they're so confident, Fisher here. They have nothing to worry about. This is the mark of the team that I think expects to be at that top end. I don't think those two picks matter. Um, they won't even touch is the question. We'll get the Lucio there. But uh, that's about it. He's actually gonna get, he's gonna get able to cap. He <laughs> just pushes step off the off the objective that the Reinhardt gets there. Misses the shatter! Beautiful jump away from Neb. Oh, that's gotta hurt if you're Kukumuku. That is uh, not what you want to see in your kill feed. Your Reinhardt shattering and then the Neb jumps away. I know, Exo Boots, very helpful ability at times. Oh boy, that's uh that's an unlucky showcase there from UO Esports Green. At least they do get 13% of the objective. Glass half zero. full and all that. We did say that. We did get 100 to 0, guys. <laughs> this is the one thing for Fisher, though, that I think um, we, can, we can really dial in, though, because this is a team that plays with swagger right there there is a, there is a cockiness to their to their style and you know we've talked to we've talked to neb before um you know if we've we've been uh you know we've heard their side of the kind of the argument and they do like to play with that aggression and here i mean it really hasn't punished them yet but that's something to consider moving into the future where they're playing against teams that are going to challenge for that first place position does that expectation continue can they continue this level of uh punishing presence when you know they get shut down and I think that's going to have to be the real difference maker here for them. Can they tighten things up and close out this map 100 to zero? And the question is always, how much do you uh, do you lose, or how much does the enemy team lose before they can finally break through that iron hold onto the spawn lord like that? Uh, UO Esports Green does get to the point first with the Symmetra here, so they do have a little bit of a better position, trading out Symmetras over here. Abs is looking for a little bit of a disruption in that backline. So far, no cigar. Now gets Lucio on the other end. Both Baptiste's out as well. So just a Lucio as a support for University of Oregon Green. And they do actually get that they get that fight win as a result. Good uh, consolidation on the point, I'd say. Yeah, and I mean, you know, not to take anything away from University of Oregon, because that was a great fight recognizing the players were out of position. But this is this is a mark that Fisher has against them. It's that level of uh, greediness sometimes in their play that forces them to overaggress and take angles. Forgotten does it just there, right? Gets picked up in the open, and now they're playing a four v five. They're not taking a front uh, a fight front to back. They're sort of trying to skirmish their way in, and UO Esports not having any of it. Uh, they're now uh, very much broken up, just trying to sort sort out their team play. They can uh, deal with the individual plays that Fisher's trying to make. The High Noon up getting much. We to get a couple of resources out, and Putter just following up on the chunk damage that was done from the High Noon itself. 
Now you have a bastion in the middle. That's fine. Let uh, hang, me hang out in the garden a little bit. Wait until this transformation is gone. Look at the bastion ult come out. Maybe get some value. We just get staken out by magician. Nothing magic about that one. That was a simple uh, click on the bastion right there. And uh, Fisher College not uh, particularly resetting. They're kind of taking fights all over the place. You'll see Cape switch over to the uh, Cassidy now off the experimental bastion. But I mean, that's about two thirds of the point gone, right? You are esports chalking up ever closer to that hunter marker. Uh, sometimes you can just have a little bit of a, of a thing. Oh, just charges past, gets booped away. Avani not lucky there. I mean, it's not even luck. The skill from Lucio on the other side, Flatline doing a great job there. Looking for a little bit more value. Abs is trying to do the similar similar thing, but enough hold on to the ledge there for a UO Esports screen in order to hold on. Abs is getting taken out at face value. Nothing happening there. Avani is coming from the back now. He's trying to set up for a shatter. Will indeed let that go, but nothing gets hit by that. Now he's now he knows what it feels like to not hit a shatter on a Baptiste. That's 95% counting. I don't know if anyone can get back. Maybe Abs can touch because he died first. Yeah, Abs will get there, but. Oh, barely, uh, it doesn't, not, even, barely doesn't, not. doesn't even touch. I mean, it doesn't matter, right? There's no way the Lucio yeah. is stalling long enough anyway. And I mean, you know, credit to you, oh, esports green there. That is, it's really easy to be demoralized when you get spawn camped on that first round as badly as you did. Um, but, and, and it, it's it, it's pretty clear, you know, not to give Fisher College any defense here because they don't, they didn't earn it, right? They didn't uh, kind of give themselves a chance to uh, to play this. If you're going to play such a hyper-aggressive style with that level of cockiness in your gameplay, you have to simply win both rounds 100 to 0, right? You can't be, you know, disrespecting your opponents coming into this. And uh, I think Fisher College did a little bit too much of that. And UO Esports not, don't get caught up in their opponent's game. They just play uh, the style that they need to. And uh, as a result, they get that first, uh, that first, or they get a round to their name. And uh, a lot of credit has to be given to them to for not falling for the uh, gambit that Fisher College tempted to bring forth. I also like this way. There's pathing over the other side of the map. Don't go over the bridge, which a lot of teams will do, and then lose and then lose that clash. Uh, now they're putting themselves in the hallway. The Maywall's already been used from Forgotten, so they don't have to worry about that. The Tracer rubbed all the back from Putter. A lot of uh, annoyance to deal with with Tracer in the back line. They will use lose THL at the beginning. It's not going to be uh, easy to uh, to work with and Kabe able to uh okay oh, sorry not gonna quit the NECC I'm sorry guys flatline with a double uh double environmental though a little bit the... of an easy uh re-entry if they want to get back quickly looks like they were able to bring everyone back into contention Potter takes a headshot from Cabe will have to be a reset and that, this is now unfortunately back to round one uh, in terms of the performance by Fisher College. I mean, if you're a UOE Sports Green fan. Oh, looking for that charge. Will not get it again. Nice uh, loop and stall from the flat line there. Okay, but is looking for it. It's not going to be able to get it. Another environmental from Flatline. They're really looking for him here, and they're also getting him. It's the third already on the board for this round. Love to see it from Jolucio. is onto Lijon Garden. Nice aggression here onto the May of, uh, of Forgotten. We'll be able to get them out of the fight a little bit. Doesn't really matter. The rest of the team will still get value. The esports green is definitely uh, putting a lot of value into that Lucio at the moment. Oh, Flatline won't have the uh, the run through any longer. Abs puts him down. I mean, tragically, the fact that that elimination comes in, that's a good shatter, but I don't think anyone can follow up. We're gone out of the fight early, though. No Maywalls to worry about. We get the putter on the May on the other side. So we're trying to counter with their own Ice Queen able to do so nice uh, charge there doesn't quite stop it uh, early oh barely does it i thought that T -O -T -H -L was going to be fine there not going to happen though neb and avani will both find find elimination there you can see it as well fisher like it doesn't mind going for these eliminations and giving up some kills on, the, on their own side because they can just keep fighting with fewer members they don't mind having limited numbers limited resources like you said that overconfidence that aggression Really putting them well. Oh, Magician rolls off the map there, unfortunately. No environmental kills necessary if they just give it up themselves. But there is the aggression coming out from the Reinhardt. Beautiful Blizzard from uh, Forgotten will unfortunately freeze a couple of people up. There goes the Reinhardt. And the symmetric turrets are oh so annoying to deal with. This chaotic last fight eventually will look looks like it will go to Fisher. You always can uh, count on some surprises potentially coming out from you. Oh, green. 
not happening this time around though. Maybe Lucio will touch once more, but that's about it. Yeah, this one will be 100 to zero for the third round. So first and last round handily in Fisher's favor. And I mean, the 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 real the real standout there for University uh, of Oregon though for me is their presence on round number two. Um, yeah, it's as I said, it's it's really easy to fall into the into the game that uh, Fisher wants to play. So to be able to reset once Fisher, you know, overstays sort of their welcome in terms of that aggression and, and still play a cohesive style is something to be, I think, lauded. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't win them the map, of course, but uh, it definitely warns Fisher that they can't just get away with absolutely everything they want to. And, you know, that bodes, it gives an opportunity at least for the uh, second half of the series once we load into maps two and beyond. Yeah, that is definitely what is, uh, is going to happen in the future. And I mean, uh, Oregon, of course, has to look out like where are the weaknesses of Fisher, and I think the weakness of Fisher is very apparent. It is their overconfidence, their overaggression at times. Yeah. Uh, and it's, if, if you're able to keep your composure like they were able to do on round two, then there is a lot of lots of punish there, a lot to do there. And I think uh, the gimmickiness that Legion Tower can sometimes bring with it, you know, the enclosed part of uh, control center, the bridge part of uh, of gardens is definitely something that helps with that overaggression. It helps put some extra chaos in the mix. Uh, but if we go to most hybrid escort and push maps, there's not really that much of that gimmick going on. So maybe there is a little bit more of an opportunity for punishment there. Yeah, I think, man, the expectation is that we go to King's Row here for map number two, considering Probably. that we opened up with the, yeah, considering right. we opened up with a brawl. And then it stayed, uh, you know, that brawl composition stayed on all three sub maps. I would be surprised if we don't go to a map that... Uh, uh, you know, kind of favors that element of, of, of gameplay, which King's Row very much does. And, um, and of course, it being the most picked map that we have overall. Uh, we do have to, I think, you know, talk about Fisher, though, because they essentially shut out on the two rounds that they won. They shut out their opponent. And um, aside from the fact that they refused to group up and, and take a, a 5v5 fight on the second phase, um, they were, I think, mechanically just ahead of their opponent at certain times, forgotten, you know, on the, on the Cassidy on round number one, um, you know, sort of rolls up and hits headshots in a row. This is where for this is one of the things that I think you need to kind of have um, if you want to shut down Fisher, you have to find a way to just slow down forgotten while not opening up your front line, because that is the other thing as much resources as forgotten kind of gets it opens up avani for uh, a lot of damage on that tank roll it, it really does and i think as well we go to king's row there's a lot of potential to see that may come out again uh work very well for the malaysian tower there was a lot of uh, blockage a lot of annoyance that came out of having her around uh now i won't say that uh, oregon didn't try and match the, the may they definitely did and i don't think it was necessarily uh, super ineffective but they were always behind on the May. They never really got their own blizzards off. They were always the ones that were react picking the May to the May that was already on the field from Fisher. So we can see some more proactive May play or some proactive anti-May play. Maybe get some aerial uh, combat in there from afar potentially. Then uh, there is an opportunity potentially to do something, do it. But the full mirror so far has not really been seemed to work out for Oregon. It, it's 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 really tough um, when you highlight that. Uh, because of the mechanical prowess that Cave and Forgotten have, right? Correct. It, it's. I think that's one of the other thing, the things too is that can you shut down a player who's just going to make play like just going to be able to you know hit their shots four in a row and just take down two players? You know, that's kind of the tough thing. So you have to find a way to slow down the hit scan of uh, a Fisher College uh, at least in as much as you can. Yeah, and I mean looking at here what. Uh... Maybe setting up for a very good opportunity for some Junkrat shenanigans here on King's Row, of course. Gone already setting up on the Widowmaker, trying to not even let them get close. I think both the spam as well as the Widowmaker, and you can see like the entirety of their comp is kind of set up of not playing as a solid unit together in terms of grouping up. Very more spread out, mobility, range, uh, constant poke, spam. It's, uh, it's great what they've got going on, but if they use the ability to correctly or if they can get split off, soloed out, then yeah, they could potentially be taken out. That being said, Magician is first to fall for Oregon. And uh, Potter soon to fall for Gun, already showing up on that hitscan roll. Three for their own. Make it, oh, almost make it four. Not going to happen just yet, but eventually they'll find another one, I'm sure. 
Yeah, three kills down, all from a Widowmaker. What are you gonna do now? Well, Putter's gonna pick the Widow of their own. See if they can actually take down Forgotten, though. Forgotten more than comfortable taking these uh, very aggressive Widow duels. Why not? They've been working out so far. The charge in there for uh, Yukumuku. Not gonna work out. Ab's gonna take down Magician early. Another punch in from the Doomfist of Avani. Not gonna get much out of it. At least we'll stall out and, and make it go shorter and longer. There's a uh, fight duration that just that comes with the ter territory of the Doomfist. If they constantly keep them looking behind them, progress is gonna be slow. Oh, Avani oh, actually, uh, Avani is like, uh, the fact oh. that the, this, uh, this Doom Fist is staying in the back line, realistically not getting as much resources as perhaps you would expect um, for the tank player. Uh, and realistically, I, I mean, UO Esports has to find a way to all in aggress and, and take down this, this uh, Doom Fist because there should not be an opportunity for them to escape as easily as they are. It's, it's a problem. Oh, they get the double kill instantly. The Baptiste and the Junkrat out of it. That's how you do it. Just instantly speed in with the amplification matrix. Take down three. Forgotten can't react and kill that many in time. Looking for a bunch of headshots here from the clock tower. Well, from the from the, uh, the ledge, honestly. A window goes to the other window. Still a shield in the way. Magician is going to have your number if you try and peek that again. And again, that's going to be the points taken. Doomfist and the Junkrat trying to come in, not quite on time. They do elimination straight after. They potentially can set themselves up for another spawn camp situation. Potter finds Forgotten. That's a lot of sight lines lost there for uh, Fisher. Not that they care. They're just going to keep pushing, of course. At least they uh, they lost them for a little bit. I mean, this is this is the thing about Fisher. Uh, you got to live by that aggression and die by it. If you're not if you're not careful when you're playing on this knife's edge, you will just lose fights and. Uh, the, the downside to it, or sorry, I suppose the upside from Fisher College's perspective is that you're going to overwhelm your opponent every once in a while. And, you know, right now, Fisher College has made the most of it for the most fights. And we've seen this approach. We used to call it the selfless approach from way back in the day. There's very few people might actually still remember that now. <laughs> the uh, cave already being found by the high noon. And this is the reason why this often works, this strategy. The amount of resources your enemy has to expend sometimes to get out of that spawn door. It was a high noon. It was a shatter. We saw uh, we saw the infrasight come out to see where they were so you can set up the play. Now you only have a sound barrier left. Maybe you're going to have that amplification matrix. So look at what Fisher's working with. I mean, Fisher also invested in that fight a little bit. There was the, uh, what do we call it, the Kitsune Rush uh, towards yeah. the start of it. So you know, Esports responds in kind. It's not, it's certainly not an easy setup for them, but uh, at least they do make progress down the, the choke point. And actually, this is even better. Um, they're going to force the meter strike for sure here. Uh, Butter finds two. Already half the back line taken out. Only going to have, have abs left. I'm looking for a little bit more, but yeah, Fisher no longer having a, a solid place to hold and catch from or attack from. Now in a bit of a, of a bad situation for Unken taken out again. This is going to be a very quick push here from uh, University of Oregon Esports Green. Wasn't that quite fast initially, of course, so they're still sort of getting out at an average speed. But it's uh, it's something. Ooh, Abs on a flank here trying to find some eliminations, but... That's a yeah, healer that's just not good. with their team. And so Avani, uh, Avani with the uh, with the Ant Matrix facing them down just gets taken out. Yo, yeah, Esports now out playing from as... as well. Yeah. yeah they're playing as a unit. Like, this is kind of what happened on Night Market as well. So, so many solo or singular units on the side of Fisher trying to run around and get eliminations. But they're not quite getting the kills on their own. And then there's just enough healing for Flat9 and THL to just keep those targets alive. And uh, then you have Magician Potter and Puku Muko just answering in kind, making sure that those singular targets do get taken out on Fisher's side. Now we get the swap from Cab, uh, from Cave onto the Bastion. Potter also has sort of opened this map up as well with some yeah, very big elimination. Great. Yeah. From back in the Widowmaker, tries to answer back, will get taken out, but uh, they found two off their own. Avani charges in aggressively, will find Potter. And there is the aggression that we were waiting for. They're kind of trying to reestablish that hold that they had on the first after the first checkpoint got taken. In that spawn door. 
cave all the way behind here. Like, this is such a risky position to do as well. We tries to jump up on the roof, doesn't quite make it. We're gonna probably try again. No one's gonna notice on the side of uh the cord and green. Let's cut our shoulder with the side, but I think that's where we can uh, caught out. Nope. Yeah, more Sun barrier. Not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. <laughs> that will take two with him somehow. Uh, so, some way, somehow, that happens with the application matrix. And then you can see, like, even though two members die, they just take two with them. And your respawns are closer on defense, so it doesn't matter. Take some putter as well. That's forgotten. Maybe it will roll a little bit further forward, but not to a very worrying degree. Forgotten just gets to back off. We'll take it out by flatline, actually. Embarrassing aggression now from, uh, from Oregon. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, good play by Oregon to not let Fisher walk all over them. If Fisher wants to take 1v1s, don't give it to him. Make it a 3v1, you know? That's, uh, that's more than okay here if you're if you're, if you're you're a University of Oregon. And that's a consumer rush that's not going to find a ton of value, and both supports are now dead, so it finds zero value. Yep. Otter gets a double once again. They're not really fights, they're just picks that happen every now and then. It's really weird. There's constantly this stream of elimination slowly going one after the other. It is going to be Oregon, though, pushing it all the way into the end. Neb cannot really do anything about that on their own. We have a Bastion ult, but what's that realistically going to do? Absolutely nothing. I mean, 56 seconds on the clock. University of Oregon is actually going to complete King's Row. You're going to be able to do it. Uh, so now, Fisher, they do have to complete the map. Uh, luckily for them, that's all they have to do. No time to worry about, because, of course, everything under a minute means that uh, completion is enough to force overtime rounds. But, yeah, completion is still something they're going to have to do. And, uh, yeah, we'll see Fisher College. The, the thing is, I have absolute faith in Fisher College, too. If they play as a five-player unit, right? If they actually play as a squad. I have, ex I have full expectation for them to complete the map, but, you know, we haven't really seen much of that from them. Um, in general, it has been a lot of chaos. Um, and UO Esports has simply just not succumbed to it, right? They're not haven't really fallen prey to the uh objective that fisher college is attempting to execute and um with that in mind i mean i mean yeah a, a really solid completion of king's row and you do really have to wonder as well when you look at a team like fisher like the the pure raw skill that comes out of a lot of these individual players how much they would get out of that if they would employ it as a more it, it feels like if they employed more as a team because obviously there is team play to it what they do it's not like complete just everyone for themselves um, but it does feel like they are using the, the the potential of their team to the fullest sometimes with these uh, with individual gear, geared plays. Um, but yeah, let's see if they maybe change that up a little bit. Uh, we see them change it in the future if it's a match or specific thing. For now, though, they're going to try and teleport potentially past the choke. I don't think they think it's necessary. There's no May to worry about. But it's going to be Bastion versus Bastion. It's a top has strat indeed. Bastion up onto the statue. Haven't seen that in a while, but it's back, especially because you're not set up statically as Bastion anymore, so you can easily drop down. More of a uh, Lee Jung Night Market strat almost. They do immediately take position on the point. Teleport goes in behind them again, but Cape immediately split off because the teleporter gets destroyed imme immediately. And unfortunately, that's the DPS down, and they're going to be a full chase down from Oregon. Four down, one to go, but I think I don't, Abs is not even going to get out. Putter with a Beautiful really defense. good defense. Yeah, Putter with a really good play there. Um, puts enough spam pressure down with the first uh, transformation to force Immortality Field out, but then plays a very passive look uh, until the next one comes in. By that point, the Immortality Field is not back up in time and is able to burn down two more players. So nice setup by the uh, DPS of UO Esports. And certainly um, an approach was made on that fight by Fisher College. That was too early. That was just too early the way that those DPS went in. There was nothing else to help them out with. Yeah, really. And again, apps just throwing, showing their face before the Reinhardt team ready to, to help them out. Okay, Cape now going on the Reaper. Would have changed up. Beautiful application matrix. A lot of damage from that double fire strike. It's gonna set up. Now wait until they come around the corner. Wait until the amp matrix is gone. Now the fight's gonna ensue. Shatter is ready here for Puku Muku. Will he be able to find the value? Sebastian Old gets Neb in the backline. Both Baptiste's gone now. The perfect time to go at it. Maybe use that Shatter, but they don't even have to. Another double kill comes out. High noon plus some Bastion firepower. 
means that new OE Sports Green is two minutes closer to potentially just full holding here. Really create a really, really it's it, a really good set down by the uh, Bastion Ultimate actually to trap uh, trap Neb. What an aggressive forward push by Fisher. Now trying to force the issue here, Nana Boost onto a transform Bastion should normally make that make that happen. But the shatter was safe from Buku Muku. They ever immediately throw it down onto that blue glowing bastion. The electric omnic as we like to call him nowadays. Not gonna be able to get anything done. The ultimate will finally found something to follow up in GHL as well. But it's still a back and forth between these two teams. The application matrix might just do enough to take down Avani and Neb. But nope, it's Avani with the firepower and two supports behind him. That's what you call the chat hard play. If you have enough healing, you can just keep swinging that hammer. UE Sports unfortunately commit a lot to that fight. We'll have to uh, take this next engagement without anything left. And so Fisher, I think this is where they look to try and put Avonia in with the... Try and put this Reinhardt to success. Have the Shatter uh, try and get past that shield of their opposition. It's a cool strategy to just uh, temporarily switch to the Ana just to uh, get your Reinhardt a little bit more back, uh, back line. A little bit more backbone. I want to call it that way. Avani now in a bit of a uh, precarious spot. Both the Metallic fields, uh, fields out. Will throw down the Shatter. Gets a punch on the ground. The follow-up is certainly there. Will not be able to push onto that Magician. She's going to be able to potentially get away with Cassidy. A couple of shots. Maybe we're forgotten. We'll get them eventually. Should, right? It should be. Yeah, it should be the end of Magician. And I say it, it's not going to be uh, a living Cassidy with the shield in the way. And there's the aggression again for Fisher. I just, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of poke phase here for, uh, for Fisher. Try to get that first uh, elimination before anyone can kind of contest. It's a, lot. it's a lot of damage. Uh, oh, Dueling Cassidy's with Dead Eye. Oh, but what had a Maywall? No! It was the uh, British standoff, as we like to call it on King's Row. Oh, there's the Bastion Ult trying to come out. Defense will not get anything frozen in the blizzard. Will Kukumuku fall? The right heart on both sides now being eliminated it is just up to the front, to the back, and the mid lines from both teams. DPS and the supports trying to have to do everything in their power to hold on to the control of this engagement. Looks like Oregon has a little bit of an upper edge with that one extra Lucio that they have. And both immortality fields gone once again. They're trading out abilities in a mirror fashion here on these times. There is the finally the sound barrier advantage potentially from Neb. The wall blocks the shatter and with 1.49 meters to go, they are almost there, but not quite for checkpoint B. There it will oh, it will still not go. High noon comes out from Medo from Forgotten. The magician doesn't even have it ready yet. And eventually, with enough damage, they will be able to push into this checkpoint. It appears to be Oregon though. Bought a lot of time. Yeah, uh, I mean, Ab still though, though the highlight worthy player of that fight, right? The sound wave to keep the Reinhardt up in the air long enough for Cade to react with the wall. Still very much uh, a chance for UO Esports Green to hold this one through. They've made they've made the Ant Matrix sing tonight, has THL. So see if they can continue to do it. The Maywall not going to survive for very much longer, and that forces everyone back, especially the Vony. Being quickly bursted down. Uh, so far, the posturing for control. At some point, this is going to explode into a fight again, but they're definitely going to wait for Avani, of course. First Shatter ready for that Reinhardt to get the Blizzard again from Ka from, from Kate as well. See if they can get the value to get out of that. Uh, it's up with the high nuke, try and counter. They do get paid before they can use the Blizzard. That is a back and forth in terms of trading. The Reinhardt gets out, abs, finds that, uh, finds that elimination. Looks for the Baptiste here, does putter on the Bastion, doesn't find elimination with it, but at least buys a lot of space and time for the rest of the team. 1.30 on the clock before they have to actually get that payload to the end. There's the aggression. Once again, forgotten with the high noon. They barely have their players back and they're already engaging. They're really timing it off the respawn. And with the magnetic grenades as well as the high noon itself, there's just shot after shot landing from the six shooter. Peacekeeper, revolver trying to get its value, and with the rest of the team being zoned. Maybe a 150 completion here for Fisher, Fisher College. 
as uh, University of Oregon gets a couple of seconds on the clock, and we're going to go into overtime rounds here, Lafon. Yeah, not a huge time bank difference from uh, from these nah. teams. UE Esports actually have been doing a good job of kiting the damage from the uh, Deadeye. Um, the end fight there really comes out of the fact that Blizzard is also available. Um, and so as uh, as Pukumuku moves forward, uh, the rest of the team gets hit with the Blizzard. It's tough kind of half... Uh, or a combo, rather, to kind of deal with if you're the defense. But I, I will say the Deadeye itself is not getting a ton of value. They're actually finding ways to turn that pressure around. And even as Fisher tries to zone out UO Esports Green, um, it ends up being a, a case of UO Esports getting a little bit more value. So definitely uh, have, have kept Forgotten in check significantly more than they did on Lijiang Tower. And it has meant yeah. that they now get three points on King's Row with a, a chance to... Uh, to get to that second round and, and try and uh, take this map away. I think the May of Cave also serves a very important purpose, not just for like fight initiation, but also to deny UO Esports to actually not fight. Because a lot of the time they're kiting those damages, like whether it's from the High Noon or from a Bastion or from whatever, like they're, they're kiting damage and they're trying to back off before they, you know, re-engage the slingshot maneuver, as we call it, um, or rubber band, whatever you want to, terminology you want to use. But then that wall's in the way, they can't actually back off as far as they want to, and they still have to fight. That might uh, make engagements a little bit more favorable. Now, of course, the May is there to just stop the engagement happening altogether, or to uh, split the team off in a very harsh way. Doesn't quite do it there, though. A little bit too early or too uh, close with the wall. Ooh, this is a, a very tough window to be in. Yeah, with that, with no damage getting brought through with the transformation of the Bastion, that is a disaster for, uh, for UAE Sports. They just don't have nearly as much consistent mid-range pressure as the Cassidy uh, and the May yeah. together, right? Um, your window of opportunity when you're running Bastion is that couple it's seconds transformed. when you're transformed, yeah. Um, so you'll get one more chance of this to our UO Esports. 15 seconds and counting, and they do engage once again. Of course, the High Noon very close for Forgotten as well as the Amplification, which is for Neb. Very hard fight to win, but they take out one of these targets early, and Neb is indeed the first fall. Magician putting that target on their backs. And Avani goes down as well. A very good start to the fight for Yuo Green as they take out more and more members. Forgotten a little bit too uh, overzealous once again on that flank, trying to get a couple of targets, but just gets left behind the dust. Everyone ran past them, past the hotel. Straight on to the point. Oh, they keep themselves going. Do Yuo Esports Green and have actually caught up mostly uh, in terms of the meaningful resources. I already talked about the fact that Forgotten has not got as much value from the Dead Eye as UO Esports has been able to kite away from most of that damage. Here, that strength is going to be mitigated because they do have to stay on the cart. Leave the payload and the overtime, of course, will evaporate. So we'll have to play around this Ant Matrix. If you are UO Esports, Fisher only have to really win one fight. That's a pretty good shield, though, if you want to use it against the Dead Eye. So, uh... Still might use be useful as a tool, even if they have to stay on it. To get the extra environmental uh, value. But to worry that no one is on the high ground behind them. They are checking flanks really well after what's been happen happening to them so far in this game. High Noon finally coming out with the old oh, good Bastion ult to try and counter that space. And there is a transformation from Puttery coming in to shatter to follow up after the shield's broken. And they just get a double kill the High Noon to follow up. Abs doesn't get charged, but doesn't have to. One surviving member will go down as well and with that beautiful play new esports green just gets to continue this cart i mean that uh, that was a picture perfect example of what i was talking about a bit in terms of dodging the dead eyes damage uh fisher thought that was going to be their win condition in fact you esports plays them like a fiddle and gets a lot more progress this though should be the fight that fisher college wins simply because the combination of the matrix of the blizzard and the shatter will touching. not allow anyone stay on the objective but for that though you always get to the yeah. second point yeah they want to use the environment it's more enclosed here but they're still engaging fairly early still an opportunity to run away the immortality field will not shape thl there goes magician the shatter is beautiful and the follow-up is there just pukumuka and flatline to stay alive they're not going to be long for this world that's going to be a round end yo esports green gets five points and points 29 meters on the cart up to fisher college to beat that distance
I mean, the, the, the story of this second half is not the fact that uh, Fisher were able to stop the payload there. Really, it's UO Esports losing the first fight as dominantly as it was, um, and, uh, sort of as one-sided as it could have been, and being able to turn three fights in a row to get to that second objective point, right? That is truly the highlight and uh, the, the, the corner that we currently find ourselves looking at, being able to work around the Ant Matrix, around the Sound Barrier, and around the Deadeye, all three of those, playing it to perfection to get themselves further in the map, I think shows the level of cohesion the squad has and their mid-fight reads on, on how to approach, you know, what, what cooldowns to use. That's really impressive stuff here from UO Esports. Uh, you love to see it as they keep continuing this uh, this map. I mean, 115 is not a lot of time to work with. UO Esports barely had more, less than that. And we saw it, one fight, in one first fight loss, basically almost decides uh, a point like that. It was a very miraculous way almost the UOE Sports screen was able to cap that first point. Didn't quite see how Neb went down in that first in that engagement where they finally were able to get it, unfortunately. Love to uh, be able to have replays, but that's unfortunately not how that works over here, of course. Go uh, see where that fire strike gets anything. The first one goes into the door, the second one does get a little bit of value. So, uh, probably maybe trying to get some ultras out of that, but it's a cutter that takes a little bit of relief. Easy entrance through the choke from uh, Fisher Collar. She's going to make to the point once again. We saw this on the first attack that they did. Not uh, Nothing to worry about just yet from UE Sports Green. They want them to be in that corner. They want them to be able to spam at them at full force. But it's going to be part of the ghost down first. One of the primary utility tool, well, the primary tools they had in mounting a special defense or offense for, for that matter. That's going to be the first point gone already, Lafon. 37 seconds on the clock. Fisher trends. Uh, tra uh transform the may wall that cave uses into the cooldown that putter has to um and you know we already talked in this map how that is the window of opportunity that you have if you're running a bastion um with it gone you're sort of sort of forced to kind of wait uh, that will allow, allow Fisher college you know when that damage threat is off the table you just run forward as a squad uh and uh, you have that better mi better mid fight rather cable yeah. so a very early pickoff so they'll get some more progress, but they are now in overtime. So uh, it is a one fight territory here for UO Esports Green, and they should get two fights out of this uh, out of this map this at distance. this rate. Yeah. There is a lot of ultimates aligned for Fisher. So they, they are looking at a bit of a better position for at least this fight. But if you drain all those ultimates, if you're UO Esports, you're going to be in a great spot to win the next one. Of course, you got to want to try and win every fight. But that is a, a thought you can have. Nice amplification mid started off with already from Neb. That's going to be one kill against the backboard off the wall. And if Pukumuku gone, there's no way that your esports is going to take this fight. But that's uh, one ultimate only used. Still two in the bank and two close from Avani and Abs. And that's uh, one more fight to go. Ooh, they're trying to hunt down Putter. Oh, they're yeah, find I, I, that, They don't even get the Lucio. Putter does not get the Lucio. Nope. Forgotten is there in time. And I think that means that that's it. No, no one, one else can touch. touch. Yeah. Oh, but they have to wait. They have a little bit of time. They have a little bit of time because it's the payload activation on point, on point two, but they don't touch an, 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 in time enough afterwards. And that's indeed going to be the completion. They could have made it. They couldn't quite get the uh, the anti CC going. Unfortunately, no one could touch. But yeah, because of the payload activation after it captures point B, they could have actually been able to uh, to stop that payload still. Still, what a performance. Fisher 2 0. So a performance from UO Esports screen that I think is oh, for sure uh, emblematic of their identity as a squad and uh, something to pay a lot of attention to uh, in, in this series. So yeah, definitely a lot of credit to UO Esports despite being down 0-2 for Fisher. I mean, they've got the micro gameplay, they've got the macro gameplay, but uh, their, uh, their willingness to overstep their boundaries a little bit continues to make itself known all these years later so we'll see if they can continue or if they can shore that up but uh at the moment they are 2-0 one map away from closing the series down yeah before we go up to map three we're gonna take a little bit of a break to give uh your oh, green and even fisher some time to strategize for the next map pick it's gonna be escort of course see you right after in a couple of minutes see you then
Welcome back, everybody. It is time for map, maybe the last map, but definitely the third map. This series is Legends West between Fisher College and University of Oregon's green team. Well, Afon, we've seen two maps. They were both very different, but also had a very similar theme between them. That is that Fisher likes to play aggressive. Yeah, and I mean, uh, the, the counterpoint is that University of Oregon plays a very cohesive, very technical, uh, very... Um, determined style overall right uh, does not overstay their welcome does not over aggress uh, and just plays you know as a five player stack so um, they were able to get five points on king's row not quite able to close out the map but did make it close and uh, obviously did have that 100 to zero on lijiang tower as well so it's not out of the realm of possibility for them to make a comeback here um though as i said it will have to be uh, a little bit uh a little bit more efficient if they want to try and close out this map which speaking of we do head to escort and it is going to be Circuit Royale. Circuit Royale. And with the Widowmaker action that we saw a little bit of on King's Row, if that continues here, it could be a fascinating duel between uh, Forgotten as well as Putter that were uh, putting out the Widow headshots. But there's a lot more, of course, to Circuit Royale than just saying, oh, here you have some snipers. There's also potential for some interesting tank play. Uh, Reinhardt being back in the meta could be a thing, but we've seen a lot of Sigma here mostly. So that's what I'm looking for. Uh, could be some other picks, you know, sometimes teams have different preferences, but talking about this level of play, there is a meta component to it that teams will usually follow. Yeah, and I mean, speaking of, uh, of tank selections, uh, we've actually had fairly limited tank play um, this game, right? It's been almost entirely Reinhardt with a little bit of uh, Doomfist from Avoni on uh, King's Row A point defense uh, on, on the first half. So, um, you know, uh, clearly, even if we do get a different role or a different tank selection heading into this map, it'll be out of the ordinary for this game, right? It is not uh, something that we've seen a ton of. So um, definitely an element, whether they play new tanks or they go back to the tried and true that they've showcased up to this point, both ways will require an element of uh, changing what we've seen um, in uh, uh, in terms of expectations uh, on on uh, on Circuit Royale. So, um, yeah, interesting, interesting to kind of have that in mind, especially because um, you know uh, over the course of I'd say the last three or so weeks, um, mobility compositions have been very prominent. Right, we haven't seen a ton of brawl. Um, relative to the last patch so it's uh it's been kind of interesting to see how that uh how that has evolved yeah even though that being said you know reinhardt of course has been in put into a very strong state for what reinhardt has been over the past years yeah so uh that is something to look out for but we did also have some very reinhardt centric maps you know lijung tower and king's row both very good to play reinhardt on especially when you don't have those long sight lines going on and those more enclosed spaces but Going to a map like Circuit Royale, there is a lot more of those long sidelines. We might see Reinhardt come back for the last point if we get into the uh, the actual casino at the end or the hotel, uh, as we might call it. But before that, we do expect a little bit more range, a little bit more uh, flexibility in that shield. And of course, the Uphidic Flux, the Rocks, the Kinetic Grasp. There are the Sigmas on the chosen fields already. Of course, it's going to be Fisher College in the blue on the defense, starting out Avani on the Sigma. Abe on the uh, uh, Hanzo, Forgotten on the Widowmaker, and then Neb and Abs on the Baptiste and Zenyatta, respectively. Looks like we're going to get a full mirror matchup. Something we haven't seen a ton of between these teams. A little bit of a variety here and there. They've been close to mirroring and uh, sometimes actually mirroring. I will actually say it's still a little bit um, out of, not out of the ordinary because Cape does play the Hanzo, but historically I believe Felicia has actually liked run the Sojourn Widow. Um, in fact, we saw Cape hover over the Sojourn in spawn, so the fact they're moving over to the true double sniper is an interesting look. Forgotten goes over the top, but Putter was checking them and uh, Forgotten quickly <laughs> ducked right back down. Both uh, both be grappling and uh, snappling a lot with those uh, Widow's kisses. Gonna be Putter that receives the first kiss in the head from Forgotten. No good, good, good night, good night's kiss just yet. They do have a little bit of a map to play, maybe more. It's uh, a good start at least for Fisher to put the pressure on that corner. I will say, despite Putter's performance on King's Row, the edge still does go down to Forgotten. Right, Forgotten is for sure 
in this matchup, one of the strongest Widowmakers we have. And uh, defensively, you have more uh, advantage on the high ground, right? You get to take, you know, more uh, passive angles. You don't have to aggress nearly as heavily. And in fact, there you can see uh, Forgotten has the whole room to work for and just takes Putter out once again because Putter has to take such, uh, you know, take swing wider to get angles on the, uh, the Widowmaker. It does feel that this is one of the few maps where the defensive Widowmaker actually has that advantage of uh, having fewer angles to check as well. You can hold a lot more, like, hold the same angle because there isn't really a lot of other places the enemy Widowmaker can come exactly. from. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, and, and there aren't a lot of other maps that are like that currently in Overwatch. Yeah, on this first choke point, I believe there's only five places you have to look uh, if you're a defensive Widow. Um, and two of them, you don't even have to move your physical position to cover, so... So far, get a uh, gun to uh, once again get that ultimate off first. Potter is barely halfway through theirs. So you know, a clean fight win, it looks like from Fisher. A little bit of a chase down on THL, but that's about it. Team kill. Fisher wants to go home, it looks like. They're not wanting to give up any room here. That cart's barely moved 50 meters. Yeah, and I mean, for, for uh, Oregon, the uh, other issues that they um, had to mirror the. Uh, amplification matrix, right? So they don't even have an alt advantage uh, in that sense. It's a good pick, though. Magician out early from Forgotten. Uh, obviously, you, you think there might be an opportunity to trade something back and do find Nep, which is a pretty big thing in terms of healing. They have to use their own transcendence to stop the uh, Graphitic Flux. The overextension from Fisher might be punished here. Forgotten is very low, so is Avani. They don't have a lot of healing left because apps had fallen too. That's just a Sigma and a Widowmaker against the world. They're not going to be able to do much. Whereas Fisher Colleges, we uh, have sort of come to see them in these last couple of maps. At some point, they overextend. At some yeah. point, they overextend, and hey, University of Oregon uh, do punish. So credit to them for that. There is an opportunity to recontest here, Fisher College. They obviously didn't overcommit. They still have the Dragon Strike to apply to the objective, and with that Inversight denied with a well-timed headshot from Forgotten, they will in fact have the point. We're close to that first uh, first objective, but they're not quite there, and with the 43 seconds on the clock, this is about their last chance to properly have a shot at it. Nice uh, corner dive from Magician will finally get taken out by the Hypersphere's from Avani. Kabe, Kabe is looking for that, uh, that, that flank on the Hanzo. Indoors will have to back off. That's a good graphitic flux setup. Not get taken out, not get rocked, but the, the uh, transcendence is, of course, there to answer. They just wanted to wave. They get stunned out, but they couldn't. And the amplification matrix of the nep. They uh, have uh, plenty of fire, firepower to fire back. 10 seconds on the clock. Can anyone actually make it? Is the question. Pukumuku goes over to the wrecking ball, so they might be able to. We have the Genji as well from Magician up in this corner. They will make it to the objective. They can't quite push it in, of course, someone will contest in time and the Wrecking Ball is going to take too much damage to actually keep this going for long. There's a couple of kills happening on the background though, the rest of the team might come back, they might be able to heal up or at least avenge the Wrecking Ball. And with the Sigma using their Graphitic Flux, this is an opportunity to potentially push the cart underneath. Nope, there's still a Neb on the cart with uh, all the kills coming back into the, the uh, kill feed for Varsity. Fisher College going to be able to take that round without a capture for UO Esports Green. That's a very strong win condition. Yeah, that was such a close fight, though. Uh, I mean, UO Esports, they nearly, nearly forced the issue with that sudden swap to the dive, right? We saw the Wrecking Ball. Tragically for UO Esports, though, is that the Gravitic Flux caught multiple members um, and forced the supports to walk forward to be the one to touch the objective, which obviously also... Uh, evaporated the healing that was required and uh, you always just run out of resources at the tail and still progress was earned and i mean considering how fisher college had that first point like the first third on lockdown uh to get this far i think is definitely a highlight or at least uh, something to work off of for university of oregon it's not a death sentence yet they still have an opportunity here to try and uh, force this fight We'll go back to the composition they opened up with. And, uh, I mean, Putter, when given the space, has had opportunity to make this Widowmaker work. And as we sort of touched on at the beginning, you know, you have the, at least some advantage with that defensive setup now, with that high ground that you control. So, have to make the most of it. A lot of pressure goes on the hit scan here for University of Oregon. 
the base two of Oregon. They have to do a very close hold, very aggressive hold. This corner is pretty much the closest you dare hold on this map. Because, of course, look at all this open space. Where are you going to hide? Where are you going to have any cover? Well, nowhere. I uh, see some teams try to hold in that forward room on the left there where you know, Cape currently entered. But that's usually not going to be a very long hold. We are going to be back between Forgotten and Putter. Let's see who gets this elimination. Does Forgotten also has this, have this disadvantage? As the offensive Widowmaker. And look how far up they pushed already, Lafon. They've barely been able to hold them at a corner at all. It's already a super aggressive posture from Fisher as we're used to. And Yuo Green is getting completely overrun here. Avani, the monster on the Sigma, used the hyperspheres to be hyper aggressive as well. And that is just going to be well, almost checkpoint A already. That's the first fight won. And they're just pushing into the spawn. This I mean, is Fisher at their finest. Yeah, the difference here is the fact that there is a May, right? Uh, the. Fisher don't make this a poke composition. Instead, they wall off uh, Pukumuku and just rush them down. And while Putter is trying to work that 1v1 from afar, there's no one to really contest. And we'll find assist. Forgotten eventually, but can anyone get on the point? The answer is yes. There's a dash. Genji just gets there with the wrecking ball. And with a little bit of power, they might be able to push back Fisher, but nope, it's Avani once again together with Abs and Neb. Butter does find the other DPS, but it's not enough that Payload will get there into the golden box of victory. And Fisher, finally in overwhelming confidence and fashion, takes down Yo Esports Green with a 3 0 victory. Uh, I mean, uh, just a, a read here that um, it's kind of tough when you're defending and you only have one point. It's a good setup by, by Fisher College, right? Having that May. You yeah. isolate the Cassidy, or so you isolate the Sigma, and there's no one to really support um, the the tank player. Uh, and so while the DPS try and just force the, you know, get that elimination from afar, they, there's no one to keep the tank up. And um, when you only have to capture one point, uh, it's uh, it's something that um, you know it, it plays really well. You know, if that map had gone further, maybe the maze not nearly as effective. But we never had that question to ask, right? So Fisher College, they do get the three L, they do get the full hold. And the University of Oregon will, alas, drop their first uh, series of the season. Yeah, at least the record, they're now they're now even. But of course, that it's also a strength of schedule issue. If, you if Oregon goes up against Northwood, we might get a very different, a very similar result as a result from Fisher. Fisher, of course, mm -hmm. now also with a 2-1. So they're both going into week number four. Like, again, equal record. But Fisher does feel pretty good about this win, at least. Yeah. Or get back to the drawing board. There was some, definitely some, some, you know, some good points what they what they were doing there. But Fisher just with the overwhelming strength in mechanics and individual skill, looking a little bit too strong of an opponent today. Yeah, uh, I mean, still time though, right? It's not uh, season is not oh, nearly course. over and done with. And uh, with that being said, I mean, I've been impressed with University of Oregon's uh, gameplay as a team and uh, yeah. uh, clearly a squad that has has provided a ton of practice. So. Uh, looking forward to see what they what they bring next uh, next time. Yeah, congrats, uh, congrats, and also good luck to their coaching staff as well. Of course, their uh, their back end support, seeing what they can make and mold further into these young individuals. As we uh, look to the future of NECC, of course, this was the end of the broadcast for this today. There are still some matches going on on the other stream, so don't forget to hop over there if you want to see the end point of those matches still going on. We have Tiny and Billy giving you the action for now. Though that was it for me and Lafon. Of course, also a big thanks uh, behind the scenes to Hippie and Bryce giving us some uh, beautiful graphics overlays as well as the observing. And uh, thank you all for watching and maybe see you next week.